Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through VCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the March 22nd agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm not aware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. Minutes of closed session and informational summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Next on the agenda is a special order of business. First up, we recognize Mr. Brian Stewart. At this time, could Mr. Stewart please join me and Dr. Williams at the front of the dais. Whereas, Mr. Brian Stewart has served the students of Baltimore County Public Schools with honor and distinction since 2015, and whereas Mr. Stewart's passion and willingness to go above and beyond to support students and nurture strong relationships with students, families, and colleagues has had a tremendous impact on Baltimore County Public Schools students and staff, and whereas, in honor of Mr. Stewart's school counseling innovations, Exemplary Comprehensive School Counseling Program and Leadership. He was named the 2022 Maryland School Counselor of the Year and the 2022 Maryland High School Counselor of the Year. And whereas Mr. Stewart's efforts to understand the individual needs of students, to encourage and cultivate their self-esteem, foster collaborative relationships, and use data to evaluate program effectiveness and programming needs has consistently resulted in academic and social advancements. And whereas in recognition of Mr. Stewart's work ethic, collaborative nature, innovative approach to supporting students in reaching their fullest potential, and dedication to building leadership capacity, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 22nd day of March in the year 2022, expresses to Mr. Brian Stewart on behalf of the citizens of this county our deepest appreciation and gratitude for his service. And be it further resolved that the board herewith ex extends its best wishes for his good health, 
happiness, and continued success. Fellow board members, I move that the board accept the following resolution in recognition of Mr. Brian Stewart. Second, Thomas. Thank you. May I have a second? Matt. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> the board is unanimous. Congratulations, Mr. Stewart. short last time. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Next we recognize Mrs. Lori Council. Unfortunately Mrs. Council was unable to join us this evening. However we would still like to celebrate her. Fellow board members, I move that the board accept the following resolution, 2022-07, in recognition of Mrs. Lori Council as follows. Whereas Mrs. Lori Council has served the students of Baltimore County Public Schools with honor and distinction since 2010, and whereas Mrs. Council's dedication kind spirit and positive outlook instills in students a deep desire to learn and achieve. And whereas in honor of Mrs. Council's exemplary leadership in the field of school counseling and her comprehensive and visionary child-centered approach, she was named the 2022 Maryland Elementary School Counselor of the Year. And whereas Mrs. Council's collaboration with students and staff to create a safe and welcoming environment and develop strategies for social emotional success makes Mays Chapel Elementary School a special place to learn. And whereas in recognition of Mrs. Council's work ethic and efforts to help students understand what a healthy relationship is, how to handle big emotions, and how to resolve conflicts peacefully. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 22nd day of March in the year 2022 expresses to Mrs. Lori Council on behalf of the citizens of this county our deepest appreciation and gratitude for her service and be it further resolved that the board herewith extends its best wishes for her good health, happiness, and continued success. Remember, may I have a motion to accept the resolution? Thank you. May I have a second? Second, Ms. Causey. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The board is unanimous. Congratulations, Mrs. Council. And her resolution will be sent to her. Finally, we recognize Ms. Kimberly Ferguson. Fellow board members, I move that the board accept the following resolution 2022-08 in recognition of Ms. Kimberly Ferguson as follows. Whereas Ms. Kimberly Ferguson has served the students of Baltimore County Public Schools with honor and distinction since 2013, and whereas Ms. Ferguson's exemplary leadership has made positive contributions to the improvement of school counseling services, and whereas in honor of Ms. Ferguson's steadfast advocacy and innovative approach to ensuring BCPS provides comprehensive and impactful student services, she was named the 2022 Maryland Advocate of the Year. 
And whereas Mrs. Ferguson's collaboration with staff across schools and central offices has consistently resulted in positive outcomes for all BCPS schools and advanced the work of the system to ensure schools are better equipped to meet the academic and social emotional needs of students across all grade levels. And whereas in recognition of Ms. Ferguson's work ethic, insightfulness, and dedication to building leadership capacity, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 22nd day of March in the year 2022 expresses to Ms. Kimberly Ferguson on behalf of the citizens of our county our deepest appreciation and gratitude for her service and be it further resolved that the Board ex extends its best wishes for her good health, happiness, and continued success. Board members, may I have a second? Second, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thomas. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? The motion carries. Congratulations. At this time, I invite Mr. Stort and Ms. Ferguson to please bring remarks. Mr. Stort. I promise I'll keep this short. Thank you. So it's an incredible honor just to be considered for this award as well as this um, incredible honor from you. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, especially when I consider the amazing counselors throughout BCPS and Maryland who go above and beyond every day. A lot of the success that I have had um, while in BCPS um, and in my career overall uh, has been due to the steady exchange of ideas and resources with colleagues in the field. Um, so they deserve equal credit um, for this accomplishment. Um, like those across BC, BCPS, our school counseling program strives to ensure every student has access to the supports, opportunities, and challenges that are necessary for their development as confident and unique individuals, uh, competitive college and career ready graduates, and responsible global citizens. School counselors have a unique skill set that can be utilized in a variety of ways to meet the diverse needs of all students equitably. Um, whether it's helping to implement a plan for getting back on track with classes, assisting with their college and career exploration process, providing support through periods of immense hardship, or simply being a resource, a steady resource throughout all of life's twists and turns, counselors are crucial for ensuring the success of all of our kids. Um, so regardless of the issue, our job is to help them process it, make meaning, find ways to move forward. Um, and this goal isn't simply to get them through one situation or one tough day. Um, but to help students develop into resilient, confident, and more empathic adults. We do this by implementing a dynamic, counseling, uh, dynamic counseling interventions that incorporate a healthy balance of support, challenge, um, helping to connect students with the people in their buildings as well as other resources that can help them move forward, um, and with a heavy dose of advocacy. Uh, so beyond demonstrating empathy, uh, implementing these array of counseling interventions, Advocacy is crucial for the work that we do each day. Counselors advocate for students as we empower them to persevere through incremental challenges, um, to find the power in their own voice, 
and situations where systemic factors may be contributing to student hardship or inequity, counselors must advocate on behalf of those students. Um, and occasionally this means that we must speak up for ourselves as well. Um, so according to ASCA, which is at the center of Comar and BCPS policy uh, regarding my profession, um, school counselors design and develop, develop, deliver comprehensive school counseling programs that promote student achievement. These programs are comprehensive in scope, preventative in design, and developmental in nature. These programs are driven by student data and based on the standards in academic, career, and personal social development to promote and enhance the learning process for all students. Um, so um, ASCII's professional guidelines, competencies, and objectives have already been adopted by our own um, Board of Education, I believe it was in 2013. Um, and this is what, what drives our district curriculum for school counselors. Of course, um, along with the curriculum, we're providing constant um, responsive services for mental health, um, helping students along with, with academic concerns, um, other you know, college and career related issues that come up, case managing 504s and, and constant, uh, an endless array of other issues. Um, so however, counselors need the time and resources and personnel required to fully address the expansive needs of students in our building and across BCPS. Um, so while the, the guidelines um, and competencies were adopted, we really need more support uh, with the, the tools and resources that are required to, to fully implement these programs across our district. Um, so that includes being ensured that counselors are able to give 80% of their time to direct student services, with 20% of their time being used for indirect student counseling services. So that does not account for the additional non-counselor related tasks um, that we are forced to do uh, every day. Now, of course, many of those are also re are required to help our schools run. Um, but knowing that there are so many different tasks that counselors need to do each day, really what we're asking for is just more help doing that. So the other piece that is not fully adopted by the board at this point um, is the ask your recommendation of 250 to one as so a student to counselor ratio. Uh, so again, that helps to ensure that our students have access to their counselor when they need, our counselors are not overburdened are, and are accessible to their students um, and can fully implement the programs that we have designed to support them. Uh, and this is something that many of our surrounding districts have, all, have already started to adopt policies to address because uh, they've found that it is crucial to ensuring the success of students not only throughout their careers in K-12 but and beyond. So um, if you are not already aware, uh, so I'm a member of our School Counseling Education Council, um, which is working with BCPS executive leadership to address some of the concerns that are reported across uh, school counselors in the district. Um, so we still have a lot of work to do. Um, Kim Ferguson has been crucial in that. We've also been working with Dr. Zarchin. Um, and again, just making, uh, helping to make sure that, that counselors have the tools, resources, and personnel required to um, fully support our students. Um, so really, um, our work is vital to the success and well-being of our kids. Um, I hope you agree. Um, and thank you for everything that you do uh, to continue the support of our students, families, and dedicated staff. Um, I know that a lot of what you do is thankless, um, but really we, we do appreciate it. I know that, that the students are really what drives every decision that you make, so thank you. Um, and I would be, I appreciate the time you've provided today and I'd be more than happy to continue this discussion with the board as well as any members of leadership as you move forward. Um, and I know that those other members of our SEEC would be more than happy to do so as well. So again, thank you. Thank you. And now I call on Ms. Ferguson. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Chairwoman Hen. Vice Chairman McMillian and members of the board. I'm honored to have been nominated as Maryland School Counselor Advocate of the Year. The support that I've received from school-based staff and central office leaders has been instrumental in my ability to be a strong advocate. When I began my tenure in Baltimore County Public Schools, I was eager to learn everything about the school counseling program and how I could support them in aligning their vision and mission to the ASCA national model. I am thankful for the support that I've received from BCPS leadership as we continue to inch closer to that recommended 250 to one ratio for school counselors each fiscal year. During my tenure, we have been able to assign part-time school counselors in each high school to specifically address college and career readiness, provide additional school counselors at identified Title I schools, place ESOL counselors at each of our ESOL centers, 
and placed a school counselor at the Baltimore County Detention Center for Juveniles. I'm also thankful for the continued advocacy around the appropriate use of school counselors. Through collaboration with senior leadership, we've continued to educate our school-based leaders on how the school counseling program contributes to the overall academic achievement and school climate when school counselors spend at least 80% of their time directly supporting students. As you know, these past two years have been like no other, no other for us all. Despite the many challenges we have faced, my team has persevered. When we went home in March of 2020, they quickly created school counseling lessons that could be delivered virtually and work with other support personnel to meet the social emotional needs of our students. After the ransomware attack, we quickly figured out how to get many of our day-to-day -day operations, like the use of Naviance and reporting CPS referrals to DSS back up and running within days. As a leader of a group of, am of amazingly talented people, it is important that I not, I not only walk the walk, but I talk the talk. My staff knows that I listen to understand, I advocate, I inform, but most importantly, I care. I care about all of them, what they do, how they are perceived, how they are respected, and how they can best serve our students, our parents, our schools, and our communities. Thank you so much for this honor. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 and E2? So move, Thomas. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Offerman. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The Thank motion you. carries. Thank, Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and the members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. There are five. Assistant Principal at Carroll Manor Elementary School, Bilingual Senior, Communications Officer in the Department of Communications and Community Outreach, two positions of Human Resources Officer, Department of Human Resources Recruitment and Staffing, Senior Systems Software Engineer, Office of Enterprise Applications, and Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Food and Nutrition. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So moved. Mac, second. Mac. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Um, Mrs. Causey first and Ms. Mack second. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Sure. The first appointee is Chloe G. Duncan to the uh, position of Human Resources Officer, the Department of Human Resources Recruitment and Staffing. Uh, she will be new to Baltimore County Public Schools. She brings a wealth of experience. Currently, she's the Senior Human Resources Analyst for Howard County Government. She's also served in several positions in Anne Arundel County and Prince George's, as well as Baltimore County Government. So congratulations, Chloe. There she is, Chloe G. Duncan. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was looking at the screen. I, it was funny to watch all of you turn around and, and look for Chloe. <laughs> Chloe is not here this, this evening. <laughs> the next appointee is Tracy L. Hanley as the assistant principal at Carroll Manor 
Elementary School. She brings to us 15.6 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the teacher of English at Hereford High. She also served as an English teacher at Lock Raven High. Congratulations, Tracy L. Hanley. Next. Yes, next we have Javine R. Hardin as the bilingual senior communications officer in the Department of Communications and Community Outreach. She uh, is bringing 19.6 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, she's the ESOL Family School Liaison in the Office of ESOL. Prior to that position, she served as a teacher of Spanish at Franklin Middle School. And prior experience, she served as a long-term sub in Baltimore County Public Schools for over three years. Congratulations, Javine R. Hardin. Next, we have Andrea T. Johnson to the position of Human Resources Officer in the Department of Human Resources and Recruitment and Staffing. She will be new to Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, she serves as the lead Human Resources Business Partner, Human Resources Generalist in the Department, um, excuse me, District of Columbia and the Office of the Eternal, Attorney General. She has several positions that she's held as a human resources business partner, as well as a human resources generalist, benefits and compensation coordinator, as well as a human resources associate, junior recruitment and intern. Welcome aboard, Miss Adria, Andrea T. Johnson. Get it out. <laughs> Next, we have Damian C. Maddox appointed to the position of Senior System Software Engineer in the Office of Enterprise Applications. She brings five years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, she is the Business System Software Engineer in the Office of Enterprise Application. Her prior experience was at Notre Dame of Maryland University, Loyola University of Maryland, as well as Towson University. Congratulations, Damian C. Maddox. Next, we have Samuel L. Mason, promoted to the Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Uh, he brings to us seven years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, he's the Field Representative in the Office of, Fi of Food and Nutrition Services. His prior experience um, were at Cartwells and University of Maryland. Don Pablo's for three years, Copeland's of New Orleans, Cozy for five years, and the Tomato Palace for six years. Congratulations, Samuel L. Mason. <laughs> that concludes the appointments. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, and for that I call on Ms. Lily Rowe, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the policy review committee ask that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Board policy 6400, special programs, magnet programs, and board policy 6402, special programs, special education services. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda in exhibit G. They are also presented for public comment prior to the final vote. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for policies 6400 and 6402? So moved, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mac. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Mm. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas? Yes. Um, I, I actually like to separate those two items out. I do have some discussion on the magnet programs board policy, but not on the other one. Okay, I will separate those. Um, and whose motion was that originally? For Ms. Mack, you made the, the motion. Um, so may I have a motion to accept the recommendation for 6,400? To separate those. Okay, no seconds needed. Any discussion on 6,400? Mr. Thomas? Yes, I'm gonna put something in the chat. Um, 
I move to insert B, guidelines shall not include priority selection slash enrollment for the children of Baltimore County Public School employees, nor grant priority placement to students with the highest performance of such guidelines. To line 34 of this policy. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, I have something written out. So our magnet programs are not supposed to be incubators for high achieving students to flee their home schools to pers in pursuit of a school with a better reputation. They should be, as our policy says, the opportunity for a theme related curricula with instructional materials for a specific and individual program. They should be an opportunity for our students, any of our students, to pursue a unique pathway to help them become college and career ready, but they aren't. Right now, our highest achieving students are the ones who are getting priority placement to these magnet programs. For example, you know, and what this does is it creates a system in which the students at Dundalk, who should have the same opportunities as those at Eastern Tech, don't. The students at Milford Mill, who should have the same opportunities and resources as those at Carver, don't. The students at Woodlawn, who should have the same opportunities and resources at, as students in Western Tech, don't. And this is a problem. I've been to schools and I've talked with our students and they see this problem with our policy. They see the problem with the selection process for our magnet program. And it's not okay for us to continue to prioritize the students that are already high achieving for magnet programs. Because again, that isn't the purpose of our magnet programs. And the way that the superintendent's rule right now is written allows for that. And I think we need to take a stance in our policy to prevent that. And although this was, discussed, this was discussed in PRC, I would really like us to continue this discussion and to continue the opportunity to make our board policy more equitable and to really provide equal opportunity for our students when it comes to accessing magnet programs. So my understanding is that the reason these things exist in policy currently is because we had a magnet task force and there were recommendations um, in that task force and BCPS employees right now, and I'm sure Dr. Williams will correct me if I'm mistaken on this, have the ability if their child attends a specific school or if they work at a specific school to be able to have their child attend the school they work at. And this in the magnet policy simply replicates that in the magnet policy that is the policy at every other school is that if there is a teacher or staff member who works in the school and they have children, their child can go to the school they work at, which in part, you know, helps with problems like I can't get to work on time because I have to drive my kid to another school, right? If you're a school staff member, that would be a problem. And as far as um, the academic achievement thing, Dr. Williams, when, is it correct that it's the top 20% of high school, um, if you score in the top 20% of that placement test, then you automatically can be placed and then the rest of the students and applications go into the lottery process. So 80% of the seats are already lottery. Can you explain that further? I'm gonna ask. I just wanna make sure we understand the implication of what we're deciding here. Because it feels like it's going into the rule, but I wanna go back and pull our staff for the specifics on that. Yes, come to the table. <laughs> So the, the high school priority that we're referring to, um, we're able to fill up to 20% of the seats in a program by the students who score the highest scores on the assessments that are conducted by the school. It doesn't involve the academic evaluation from the report cards. It's only based on the assessment that's evaluating whether the student's appropriate and, and has a good chance of being successful in that particular program. Um, so for example, if we have a program that has 20 seats, we can fill up to four of those seats prior to the lottery by the students who would score the highest score on that magnet assessment. And is, is Dr. Williams correct? Are these things that are accounted for in the rules? Yes, this is okay. in the rule. So this is not something that's subject to current policy? Um, I assume that that's true. Okay. Correct, thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the conversation. Um, I did want to get additional information from staff as to um, the numbers related to uh, teacher um, preferences, um, because I, I guess I wanna see if there's, how large of an issue that is. 
I do understand um, the special permission transfer that our um, staff are allowed to request and they have to be approved um, based on criteria in terms of making it feasible for them to work in different locations than their, than their children's home school. So I'm just wondering if there's staff that has that number or if uh, that Mrs. Could be Cozzi, is your later. microphone on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, we, we have very few instances where we have students who are placed in a magnet school because the parent works in that magnet school. Um, but that is part of the rule that they are able to do that. Um, typically at a school, if we have one or two parents who work in that school would have their children attend. Um, at the elementary and middle school, it's an automatic. At the high school, that student also has to perform at least 80% in the evaluation process in order to qualify for that priority placement. And Brian, would you just introduce yourself and I'm your sorry, position? Yes. No, no, no worries. I'm Brian Stoll. I'm the coordinator for BCPS Magnet Programs. Okay, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. You're thank welcome. you. Dr. Hager? Um, I just wanted to clarify, and, and if you have any comments on this, um, so the, the um, motion says highest performance on such guidelines and the concern about being college and career ready, but many of our programs are, include fine arts and other trades and other skills that the students are gaining in these programs, and the assessments are relevant to those programs. So it's, we're not talking about scoring the top on an academic assess or a, you know, straight math and reading assessment, it could be a, a practical assessment that the students are getting scored on through dance or through culinary skills and things like that, correct? So there are other ways for the assessment. Right, for, for our arts programs, that's absolutely true. Um, the assessments are uh, completely based on uh, performances. Um, for the vocational programs and the other academic programs, there are academic components to the assessments. So that is part of the evaluation process. Thank you, and, and um, given that that I, I do not support this motion, so I, I think the rule as it stands is, is okay. Thank you. Ms. Jose. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thomas, you attend Eastern Tech, which is a magnet school, and from what I just heard, uh, it looks like 20% of the students are based on assessment and the 80% for high schools, and we don't follow the same rule for middle and, and elementary schools, are based on a lottery program. So uh, I'm kind of confused as to how the 80, if the 20% are only allocated based on assessment, uh, what happens to the other kids that also assessed and did well? Because we've seen a lot of emails and complaints from parents whose kids took the assessment and didn't make it. Um, so how do we address that? And how does our equity policy 100 that undergirds everything we do play into this policy? And I know, Dr. Williams, you keep saying we need to look at it from a policy level, but we all know that despite ongoing efforts, uh, racial disparities are particularly pronounced in a magnet school program. So what are we uh, doing? So I, I do support Mr. Uh, Thomas's motion. I think we do need to take a closer look at this from our um, equity point of view. Dr. Williams, would you like to respond? Well, I, I guess the only response I will say that this was the policy that was bring forth and there was language around the rule that was, that was put on the table. So I was just clarifying the difference between the two. Um, and, and so that's the only comment I have at this time. Thank you. Board members, any other comments or questions before we call the vote? Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to clarify that at the middle school level, it's 100% lottery for the magnet programs. Is that correct? So there is the employee priority that's mm -hmm. available at the middle school, but other than that, it's 100% prior, 100% lottery. Okay, thank you. Um, so I won't be supporting um, this motion. Um, I appreciate the intent behind it, but I also wanted to understand is there a report that is available that shows disparity in our magnet program acceptance rates around um, uh, ethnicity or race or any other student identifier? So we recently made a presentation to the uh, 
Board Committee on, on Equity, um, and the data that was presented was enrollment data, um, which didn't identify great deals of disparity between um, white students and non-white students, males and females, um, but uh, you know we can certainly make that information available to the board as a whole. Okay, certainly, because that would be concerning and, um, and um, that would be one of the things where um, you know, we would hear a report of what the plan is to address any inequities. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Yeah, I think it's important to point out, uh, and perhaps, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, as far as uh, placing the, the, the students who are, who are the uh, children of, uh, of, our, of our staff in the schools, some of these, some of these schools have, are, are not just totally magnet schools. They are they're schools that have, that have magnet programs. So, when it, so, for instance, when I was at my time in Towson, we had students who came into the magnet program who happened to have parents, but that's because they met, they met the other criteria. We also had students who came to Towson, however, because it was close, it, it, it was the school closest to or it was the school of the, uh, of the uh, a staff member. So uh, I think that's important to point out, too, that there's not, just, not everyone qualifies for magnet because, now I know in the case of Western and Eastern, these are, these are of course, totally magnet schools, but uh, in, in many other places where the magnet programs, you know, you can come to the school, but, but I don't think it has any, I, I don't believe it has any, does it have any influence on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, excuse me, any influence on the uh, placement in, into the magnet, that school? So for a school that has a program within a school like Towson, all of the students, whether they're zoned for that school or outside of their attendance boundary, would have to apply to participate in that program. And there would be no preference shown to, no to, preference. to anyone who was, a, who, was a, who was a staff member. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jose, is your question on this policy? Yes, it is. Okay, go ahead. Um, sorry, uh, the chat seemed to be muted, and I couldn't see, Mr. Thomas, your... Um, it's muted and I can't see your thing very clearly, but um, I don't believe there's a lot of, uh, I don't know the percent of children that are staff that are enrolled in there. I, I, I reckon it's not gonna be a large percent um, of children that are coming from staff, which I think I totally support if, if, if uh, there are teachers that are teaching there and their kids wanna attend. My, my concern really was more from an equity point of view of the 80% uh, that are coming in through the lottery program. So I'm quite not sure where I stand with your motion right now. So I, I know I did second it and I recognize that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. And I just want to state again that I think the 20% rule that we have right now allowing the highest achieving students is a direct odds with the idea that our magnet programs are supposed to be available to all of our students, that our magnet programs are supposed to be programs dedicated to theme and curricula, you know, not really dedicated to uh, the programs for our highest achieving students to get into. So I want to say that, and I understand that the language might not be the best for the policy. So I'm going to make a motion after this, I'm assuming this will fail, so move it back to PRC just because I think we should continue this conversation, and I, I would like to, but thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Um, I would just like to point out, I quickly looked at the breakdown of students. Um, somebody mentioned Western Tech. There are 920 students at Western Tech. 514 of them are African American. 190 of them are Asian. 48 are Hispanic. And that's as far as I've gotten. So, um, however the process is working, it looks like we have a very diverse group of students. And prior to the pandemic, I attended the cultural coalescence program at Western every year. And it was just students from all over the world celebrating their heritage. And it did not jump out. It, the numbers support what I saw. That West, I'll use Western because it's the school I'm most familiar with. It's a very, very diverse place. So. I, I think the numbers speak for themselves. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. And um, thank you, Mr. Thomas, for bringing this forward um, and trying to work to make our 
magnet program more equitable because I, I, I believe that's what, what you're um, trying to do. So um, I'm not sure that that um, I agree 100 percent with what was just put up. Um, so <clears throat> if it were to go back to the committee to be fleshed out a little more, I think would, would be a good thing. Um, I had a question about the chart that was put up or rather the pie graph that was just put up and that was presented to us at the equity um, committee meeting and it looked like it was presented in December 16th and I wanted to know the last chart where it says BCPS and magnet program school year 20 to 21 um, I, particularly the gray amount where it says AA 40% um, 40.10% 40 um, I guess is that the enrollment of students who are um, AA is that African American and then magnet programs it shows 53% in African American and so in my understanding that 40% of our student population is African American and 53% of those students are enrolled in magnet programs now my question would be are those magnet schools as well as magnet programs like what um, uh, what Mr. Offerman just talked about mag magnet programs being like a Towson and um, and schools, or is it just magnet schools? So without looking at the graph, I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, the data on the magnet was specifically magnet students. It didn't, if it, so for example, the program at Towson, that magnet demographic represented just those students that were participating in their magnet program whereas the data for the district as a whole was every student in the district, uh, which would have included the magnet students as well, I believe. Okay, so that includes magnet students in magnet programs and students at magnet schools. For the, for the school system number, I believe that's accurate, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. The, the issue that I'm trying to address here isn't that our magnet programs aren't diverse. They are definitely diverse. I go to Eastern Tech, it's a very diverse school. It's the fact that the students at Eastern Tech are in this environment that is so enriched with so many of these academic resources and the supports that isn't half a mile down the road accessible at, at, at Kenwood High School. That's kind of the thing that I, I really think we need to address in this policy. Time, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, board members? Ms. Joes? And then Mrs. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Thomas, I see what you're trying to do, but I don't think this um, motion that you're making addresses that. Um, therefore, I, will, I, I don't think this is the, the correct uh, way. I, I clearly see what you're saying. You're trying to make our resources equitable, and it should be available to Kenwood uh, students. And it's not so much about racial diversity. You go to Eastern Tech. Um, and a lot of people that I know go to Eastern Tech. It is about um, opportunities for some of our most impoverished and underprivileged children. Um, that's what you're trying to address, and I don't believe this motion addresses it. However, uh, I get your, your reasoning behind it, and I do support that reasoning. So thank you for uh, bringing this to discussion. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Thomas, I appreciate this conversation, as I said before, and the goal of the Board of Education is to ensure uh, that every child is rigorously prepared for college or career. And uh, they, we, I was encouraged, we had a curriculum committee meeting, and they are evaluating the lessons learned and the new strategies that were uh, utilized during the pandemic in terms of remote learning, uh, addressing uh, staff that had particular expertise, but more students having access to them virtually, uh, lessons that they're learning through our virtual learning program. So I'm optimistic that things will improve to have more opportunity for students no matter where they go to school. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Gover and IT, for displaying um, the information requested by Dr. Hager. Is that the correct slide, Dr. Hager, that you had asked? Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or comments regarding the, the information displayed? Um, um, I'm sorry, Ms. I Rowe? just had, I had put in the chat. I'm sorry, Ms. Um, Rowe, go ahead. I just wanted to point out that it's important to realize that these magnet programs are different, and I would dispute the fact that Kenwood High School has 
fewer resources and fewer opportunities than Eastern High School, Eastern Technical Institute. These are different programs. My daughter got into Towson, Eastern, and Kenwood's IB program and made a conscious choice to go to Kenwood's IB program because of the academic rigor at that program. And I would absolutely dispute that the academic rigor of that program that, is any less than time. Eastern's. Thank you, Ms. Rao. Okay, there's no further discussion. Um, Ms. Governor, may we have a roll call vote on Mr. Thomas's motion to amend policy 6400? Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Hem? No. The motion fails. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation? Ms. Hem. The motion on the floor to that effect, I believe. So the original motion that was on the floor was to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee. Mr. Thomas, I'm going to process the motion that's already on the floor. Um, to accept the recommendation. I would just like to send this There's back. There's already a motion on the floor that I'm going to process. To accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for policy, for policy 6400. Ms. Han, I have a, a point of clarification. Yes, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, this is to Mr. Brusades. There's a motion on the floor. I get that, but doesn't the motion to postpone supersede uh, the motion on the floor, Mr. Brusades? And that's what Mr. Thomas is trying to do. It's not a motion to postpone, as I understand it. It's a motion to refer to committee. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the motion on the floor is to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for policy 6400. No second is needed. Any discussion? Mrs. Causey. Thank you. I just want to clarify that this is first reader, and shortly we're going to hear from our public, and then um, we'll have second reader, another opportunity for the board to... That's, uh, the, that's the procedure, okay, yes. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Oh, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I would just like to say that I, I do want to send this back to the committee. I think the, it, it, it needs to be reviewed by staff. I really think we should dive into this policy more. I mean, we weren't able to in the committee because of time constraints. Uh, I feel like we, this is a policy that is so important considering how important magnet programs are to our community. So I would ask that board members vote no and that we can send this back to committee. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Grover? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bill. Thank you. We have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Policy 6402. So moved, Mack. Thank you, Ms. Mack. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members Excuse of the Excuse me, Ms. point of clarification. Ms. Scott, is this regarding, yes, we were moved on to public comment? Um, I believe there was a question in the chat before we had moved on to public comment. Um, and I wanted to know, even though we had finished voting on policy, if um, that question could be answered. It looks like, um, as I'm seeing, it wasn't said verbally, but it was put in chat. We, we were in the middle of voting when something it popped came up. In before, it came in before we started voting. We were in the middle of voting. But it came in before we started voting. We were in the middle of voting. We, we were processing the motion on the floor. Okay, so this is robotic. Um, 
I was doing a point of clarification. So if we don't say it verbally so that you can hear it, if it's put in the chat before we are in the middle of voting, before we are in the middle of voting, then it's not recognized. Ms. Scott, I can't read minds. I'm trying to facilitate the meeting. If something but comes in while if something comes in while we're in the middle of voting and, and I'm processing Ms. Scott, if I'm processing Just something on the floor and something comes in while we are voting, I'm finishing processing what is on the floor. So I'm asking a point of clarification if it comes in before we are processing our votes, before we are voting. Not reading minds, reading the chat. So, okay. That's fine. I'll just going forward. I'll just make sure that it's vocalized since the chat is not being properly read. Miss Scott, I cannot facilitate a vote and read the chat at the same time. If it comes in and I see it, I will acknowledge it prior to voting. So noted. Thank you. Miss Hen, my question was about pol general policy. That was what I put in there. That's why I waited for the, the votes to be done. And if I could unless we moved on, it was about um, the about policies that were not reviewed in PRC and where we were with that, some of the MSD deadlines. Okay, Mr. I'm happy to add that to a, a future agenda. Um, you can request that be, be added. We have board committee updates and agenda setting as item M, if you would like to add that to as a request for agenda setting. Madam Chair, I'll be happy to talk about that in the committee update. Ms. Rowe, thank you. If you'd like the floor, please request it. Thank I was, you. I was just saying later I'll do it. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who have registered to speak to attend in person. Regist registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Bosch Ferrone with the Central Area Education Advisory Council. Dr. Farron? Sorry, I lost track. Is this about the central area or the policies? Central area. This is stakeholder comment. Good evening to all. Our members want the Board of Education and Administration to give us a follow-up on the board on, on the school system plans uh, in relation to teaching foreign languages, Arabic, Chinese, and the G7, as I recommended before. 
This is only a gentle, friendly reminder. We just really need to know. We understand you have fiscal responsibilities and difficulties, but if we can have a follow-up, I think that would be helpful. Our next event is going to be April 6, Wednesday, April 6. It would be on Zoom, 7 p.m. And uh, this presentation is going to be related to discipline versus punishment in the school system. Um, our members have been organizing this. We are still in process in selecting speakers. Um, I see we have three excellent candidates. Uh, one of them probably would be one of our speakers. The members want to know in relation to this subject, what's the definition of discipline? What's the definition of self-defense for a student? How can we address discipline policy in relation to elementary school versus middle school versus high school? What are the etiologies of a negative student behavior? Why the policies 55-50, 55-80, 55-61 has many elastic and vague terms in them such as orderly conduct of work, such as positive behavior, such as threaten or endangering behavior. Um, and what's the difference between discipline and punishment in addition to other questions? So we hope really in our next presentation, uh, which all of you will be invited and the public outside and parents, that we'll be able to shed uh, lights on uh, uh, these uh, topics. We are really eager to do better in this next presentation than what we did with the mental illnesses in adolescence uh, in early March. And I thank you again for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Billy Burke with Case. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman, Mrs. Hen, Vice Chair, Mr. McMillian, Superintendent, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the members of CASE. I'd like to begin tonight by thanking Ms. Anderson for her unwavering commitment to solving the staffing shortage. BCPS has made great gains in hiring, and CASE is grateful for her work. But there is more work to do. The staffing shortage is a nationwide problem and looks to be here for a while. I would offer that we need to continue to refine and innovate our staffing models. This includes ideas like blurring school enrollment boundaries so students can take class in more than one location. It means expanding virtual options for specific classes. It means setting scheduling criteria for class size. It means prioritizing schools that are historically difficult to staff. It means reviewing the extra 15 minutes so that all schools have the capacity to implement, and it means to stop approving decisions like the extra 15 minutes without a fully developed implementation plan. I'd like to talk to you for the remainder of my time about some of the struggles case members face. The world has changed. Many people feel entitled and empowered to criticize and humiliate. I know you see that in your emails every day. Case members deal with this from every angle. The role of principals, assistant principals, and central office supervisors is one of change agent. Being the change agent makes case members the primary target for criticism. Decisions that create a change in processes and the decisions to implement new programs and ideas are made from above case positions. But case members dutifully task, uh, are dutifully tasked with carrying them out. Sometimes that change is something like establishing and following safety procedures, like masking or establishing six foot, six foot distancing in the time of COVID. But often the role of case members is to support and monitor instruction to improve outcomes for children. Case members must ensure that students receive equitable access to rigorous curriculum and assessment. That often means asking staff to change the way they teach and the resources they use to teach. 
No case member wakes up each morning thinking, I'm going to go into school and mess with everything just to make staff and family upset. But it is their job to review the data and make changes. It is their job to ensure protocols are correctly followed, even if they've never been followed before. Just like it's your job to review the data and make changes. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton with Tabco. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members. Over the past few weeks, I have had the opportunity to meet with leaders of local, state, and national education unions. There are two issues that are rising to the top for almost all of us, staffing shortages and discipline and safety concerns. We all know there's a national labor shortage affecting seemingly every field. But above all, educators need time, time to plan, to connect with students and families, to teach, and time for themselves. The current labor shortage makes all of this even more difficult. I ask this board what is being done to attract and retain educators in BCPS. Every other school system is facing these challenges. What are we doing differently? We cannot be complacent. We must be bold. A recent Forbes article states, students aren't performing so more burdens are placed on teachers to help students hit the mark, thus decreasing teachers' time and bandwidth to forge a human connection with students that is the basis for all learning. Teachers' legs are cut out from under them, yet they're still expected to carry their students across the finish line. It's a gridlock. This is not news to any educator working with students. It is happening to us every single day. What to do? Take away tasks that are not truly mission critical. Our students must first feel connected with their teacher for authentic learning to occur. We can't do that with overcrowded classes, endless coverages, and too much other stuff that takes away our time with students. I have said before, every single task simply cannot be essential. Let's focus on what truly is. We can work together and make this happen. Discipline and safety concerns are also on the radar seemingly everywhere. I hear from educators, parents, community members, the press, all wanting to know how these concerns are being addressed. We must work together, unions, students, parents, administrators, staff, to find a way to create and develop authentic discipline plans. As stated in policy 5510, which says schools are to develop and implement a school-wide positive behavior plan. This is to be done in collaboration with educator councils and faculty representatives per section 11.1 of the master agreement. Can we please work together to be sure this is happening and these plans are in place, implemented and assessed for effectiveness per the policy? A plan won't fix the undesired behaviors, but we can't fix them without a plan. As always, TABCO stands at the ready for our students and our educators. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Courtney Jenkins with AFSME. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, Dr. Superintendent, Dr. Williams, and distinguished members of the board. My name is Courtney Jenkins, and I'm a proud member as well as staff representative with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 67, Local 434, or ASME. Here with the permission and on behalf of President Brian Epps, where we represent the working people who support the critical infrastructure of our school system, which includes our food nutrition workers, transportation employees, grounds, building and maintenance workers, and that's just to name a few. Our members are on the front lines as the first and last contact of the school day for many of our students. This has been true for decades and even more critical to the mission of BCPS as we continue to get through this unprecedented public health crisis that is COVID-19. The pandemic has impacted nearly all elements of our lives and has only exacerbated ongoing staffing issues. We're here to bring two calls of action to the board today. The first call is the system needs to address the ongoing staffing shortages by making sure that all schools have a full staffing complement that meets the needs of the system and students. And number two, protect our work. Outsourcing and privatization is not the answer to the issues that confront the school board. 
collaboration with the employer unions ensures systemic issues are addressed and are accounted for. Many of the actions we are calling for are contained within the Baltimore County Public Schools Operations and Efficiency Review Report, released this past September. And many of those actions we are calling for can be utilized, can be supported by utilizing pandemic relief funding. I will close with a personal experience. Uh, late last year, I had the pleasure of joining with my wife and her former classmates for an impromptu reunion of sorts. All of them were alumni of the George Washington Carver Center for the Arts and Technology. Our friend had a lead role in Dream Girls at Center Stage, and a mutual friend of the Carver alum, Miss Brittany Spencer, who was recently featured in the Country Music Awards, had a performance at a tour stop in Baltimore. The entire group, excluding myself, graduated from a Baltimore County Public High School and went on to do great things, my wife being now a marketing executive. But they all participated in the magnet program at Carver. Why is this important? because many of them had to take a bus to get there from their area, and it was our dedicated drivers and attendants who made that happen. When they got to school, there was always a meal available to them thanks to our food service workers. And as they learned, there were always a safe and clean learning environment provided by our BOS and building service workers, grounds and maintenance employees. This is why a living wage and respect in the workplace matters. It wasn't just our teachers ensuring our success, it was all staff who looked out for us as if we were their own. A successful learning day doesn't stop at the doors of the classroom. It extends by way and virtue of our dedicated support professionals. Ask Me 434 will continue to support the mission of the Baltimore County Public School System and will, work, and will continue to be willing to work together with school board leadership to make a, a BCPS a premier public school system and employer. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Sharon Saroff. I hope everyone can hear me through this mask. I'm one of those people that's uh, immunocompromised, so. I'm going to talk about a couple of things this, this after evening, excuse me. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is communication, which I know that Baltimore County Public Schools prides itself on. But from what I'm seeing recently, it is becoming increasingly difficult for parents and people like myself in the community to access vital information, such as who's the principal of a school, what the telephone number of the school is, if I have a problem, who the executive director is, because there are no more uh, community superintendents, um, who do I contact if uh, special transportation is not available, um, if there's a bus speeding down my street that's not supposed to because it's a cul-de-sac. It used to be that if I went on the Baltimore County website, I could find the uh, first page profile of a school that would tell me the name of the principal, the vice principal, the zone, and who I could contact if there was a problem. That's not available to me anymore. Now I have to go on a fishing trip to find that information including getting a hold of the phone number to contact the school. Thankfully, I have an old directory at hand in my computer. How do we fix it? Go back to having a profile page where a person can easily find that contact information, the name of the principal, the name of the vice principal, who the executive director is, because that's nowhere on the website. Parents need to be treated as collaborators, not as the enemy. I am going to start my concerns about special ed now. I know that we're going to be talking about it in a little bit. Special education is the problem of the entire county, not the individual school. And in Baltimore County, we treat it as through the individual schools right now. If I'm an administrator and 
I feel that my special ed students don't deserve or I can't schedule them to be in a music class and I can only schedule to be in an art class, that's all they get access to. And I'll finish my comments on that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janice Lepore. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. My name is Janice Lepore. I'm a parent of three children, school-aged children here in Baltimore County. My colleague will introduce herself. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Pasteur. <laughs> we are here on behalf of Strong Schools Maryland as the co-captains for Baltimore County. Strong Schools Maryland is an advocacy organization that supported the blueprint development process and the passage of the blueprint legislation. The current mission of Strong Schools is to support and monitor the implementation of the blueprint components in each district to ensure that each student has equal access to a world-class education. As education advocates in Baltimore County, we are looking forward to the many benefits of this legislation, including access to well-designed pre-K programs, increased teacher salaries, more career and technical education programs, more dual enrollment programs, community school supports, and additional per pupil funding. Let's talk data. Blueprint is critically important because Ms. Mack, 55% of Maryland students were not reading on grade level by grade four in 2020. 44% of educators leave the profession within their first five years, Mr. Offerman. It is projected that 65% of all jobs require educational training beyond high school. Mr. McMillian, 55% of Maryland schools serve a high concentration of students experiencing poverty. Mr. Thomas, Dr. Williams, you already show alignment with Blueprint at every board meeting. Please continue to do that. Board members, we are your resources for your questions. We are your people. We're here to answer all of your questions about Blueprint. No time limits, just answers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Salim Higgins. Oh, uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Superintendent uh, Williams and board members. Um, the uh, Baltimore County School Board Nominating Commission is still accepting applications for the board's four at-large seats uh, for the four-year term beginning December 2022. I'm not a member or representative of that, um, but I think it's important to share that information. Uh, applications are posted. Uh, on the Baltimore County Public Schools uh, website and will be accepted through Friday, March 25th um, at 4 p.m. So yes, that's this Friday, <laughs> so you still have time. Um, and so if you're at least uh, 21 years old, a uh, Baltimore County resident for at least two years and not employed by Baltimore County Public Schools, those are the main criteria. Um, I'm sharing this information uh, because I believe it's vitally important that the school board reflects the diversity of the communities they serve. And there's so many decisions, I'm preaching to the choir with you, obviously, when there's so many decisions being made um, that, are, that impact their children on a systems level. And so we, we clearly need a wide range of views and experiences to best address the needs of all of the children in uh, Baltimore County. So again, I implore everyone uh, watching, listening, um, to go to the BCPS website. Uh, you have a few days and a couple of hours. Um, finally, um, I just want to acknowledge um, Mr. Tony Bazemore uh, from the Office of uh, Governmental Relations and Constituency Services. Um, I appreciate your deep commitment to community outreach and engagement. Um, you've been 
a willing uh, mentor, and I truly appreciate you. Also want to acknowledge, and she's not here, hope you get better, uh, uh, Ms. Makita Scott, board member uh, Makita Scott. Um, she's an amazing ambassador for BP, BCPS. I bumped into her at so many different uh, meetings, um, and many of which um, she attended um, not due to her responsibilities as a board member, um, but just due to her uh, commitment to the community as a Baltimore County resident. And so I've seen her on the front lines fighting for her children with no cameras or photo opportunities. And um, she's there just for a love of the community. So I want to acknowledge her. And finally, um, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Principal Martin of Newtown High School who's actually in attendance. Uh, my daughter is a senior at Newtown High School and um, he has worked tirelessly with uh, PTSA, community association members, students and various uh, community representatives to create um, the best opportunities and experiences uh, for our children. And, and to make sure that we aren't simply uh, stakeholders, uh, but that we're a genuine community. And all of the people that I acknowledged uh, tonight, um, they have that same um, uh, mentality. Um, so I think it's vitally important that we all work together. Again, thank you. My name is uh, Salim Higgins. And again, appreciate you all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Adams. Good evening, everybody. Um, I wanted to start off by mentioning school safety and discipline is one of uh, the community members' top concerns and BCPS families. I see it's not on the agenda tonight, but we are anxiously waiting for an announcement addressing issues that have come up in our schools. I also want to recommend that y'all take some time and listen to today's Maryland State Board of Education meeting and the presentation given by Karen Chenoweth. It was called Districts That Succeed, Breaking the Correlation Between Race, Poverty, and Achievement. Ms. Chenoweth was invited by the state superintendent and has a 20-year background of research and education. She presented long-term data that shows how schools improve their academic outcomes for all student groups and close the gaps between groups that were previously on the lower end of academic proficiency. I found the information very interesting and appreciated her concrete suggestions that have been successful in many other places. In reference to the academic presentations at our board meetings, after listening to them and reviewing the attachments, I'm often left with many questions and a feeling of confusion. We've heard a lot about acceleration and how it's the best practice to address pandemic learning loss. It's now March, the third quarter. Can anyone in the room stand up and use the data to show us how it's working? Tell the community that you were elected and appointed to serve, that the system's plan is working. Can you share the data that we are in fact closing gaps that were very wide before the pandemic and now are vast caverns? At the meeting two weeks ago, we heard that the data presented was unreliable for a number of reasons. It was one data point, it was a bad test, the test changed, assessing kids is very difficult. But I can look at years worth of data on Maryland's report card and on our very own website, I can look at each school's dashboard that shows the proficiency rates from the year 2018-2019. It's all very concerning and it's not improving. A few meetings ago, the NAACP president spoke about the academic needs of students not being met. What assurances can you give the Baltimore County residents and parents that you're aware of our downward trend in our system and you're addressing it with urgency and purpose? If all of the individual data points are showing the same thing, when are we going to get to see any data points that give us confidence that we're on a path, that acceleration is working, that there is a true concern or a plan for the fact that our students have been in a proficient downfall for quite some time? How are you assuring us that second graders who have missed everything will get what they need? Tonight we will hear about the second quarter data. It wasn't available to the public before the meeting, so I'm very curious. If it focuses on quarter grades, I have some concerns. There is a culture of leniency within BCPS. For example, teachers can subjectively change grades. Assignment deadlines are not concrete. Homework no longer counts as a portion of an overall grade. With strong foundations and appropriate supports, kids can rise to this challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil.
Good evening. Good evening. Peace and blessings to all that are present and also those who are on virtual system. 40% of our students are African American. 36% are white, 12% are Hispanic, and 8% are Asians. Of the 32,000 students in our 30 high schools, 14,000 are African American, 12,000 are whites, 3,800 are Hispanics, and 2,700 are Asian. American English is spoken by 78% in our entire population, which became de facto official language. 22% speak other languages and English too. BCPS requires its students to complete two credits in world languages. The second most spoken language after Spanish by our students is Yoruba, which is spoken in 12 different countries. Spanish is offered in five high schools and 14 middle schools. French in, two high, in 12 high schools and 10 middle schools. Chinese in eight high schools, two middle schools. German, which is only spoken in five countries, taught in one high school. Japanese spoken in one country, in one middle school. Arabic is spoken in 28 countries, and every one of the 1.8 billion Muslims is expected to know this language, just as Latin, which is spoken only in Vatican and is being taught in two high schools and Western tech. Our trade and alliances with nearly 56 Muslim countries is just as important, if not more, than China, Japan, Germany, France, Spanish-speaking countries, and Vatican. Inclusion of Arabic and Yoruba in the world language curriculum will assist our country in trade relations, major multinational businesses, State Department, and armed forces too. The Defense Department needed Arabic speakers. Its Monterey School of Languages was the only legitimate source, but very limited. Students in the region of Catonsville, Randallstown, Owings Mills, Ricestown should be given the opportunity. And those are logical, good locations to start. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fern, you're next. When I'm next. Mm -hmm. Please take my comments today in a positive way. They are. I went to a medical conference Saturday and Sunday out of state, and I really thought of you, the school system. So I was in a hotel, which I really love. I woke up three in the morning, and I looked into my right side, and I saw a roach two feet away from me. Now, this is the hotel that I really love. So anyhow, seven in the morning, I signed out. I talked to the manager, described the roach, <laughs> and um, he was very apologetic and promised to take care of it immediately. And he refunded the full amount of money, $237. Why am I saying this to you? It's about customer service. We, the public, are your customers. I asked the school system for access to the curriculum for almost two decades. And I can't really get 
through despite the best effort. I saw that roach, Islamophobia, in the curriculum a few months ago and the curriculum department took care of it. But you know, when you see one roach, you know there is a mama roach and a papa roach and a cousin roach. I have been around for a long time. I believe I am a nice guy, straightforward, <laughs> you know. I love the school system. I am product of the school system. My three sons are product of the school system. I mean no harm, but I want to know that there is no Islamophobia period in the curriculum. I'm tired of it. And I want to know that before I wind up to be in a nursing home and not able to come and speak to you. So I love the Hilton. They have excellent service. They do. I think the school system can learn a whole lot from the services of commercial companies. We really can. We should. We are your customers. I paid half a million dollars of county taxes over my 48 years in Baltimore County. It's not cheap. And of course, I'm not that rich. You know, there are people who are. Thank you. Next is Ruben Amaya. Welcome. Well, good evening, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board. It's great to be back here and address you all. You know, as we face daunting challenges within our education system, from staffing shortages to giving our students a normal learning environment, I think what is so great about our education system is that it's a reflection of the diversity of our county, diversity in religion, race, background, creed, and ideas. Ideas that help us reflect upon and consider how we can improve our society. But across the country, we are seeing outright, uh, outright attacks on the dignity of education. Many elements of our history, diversity, and society are being and have been unwelcome in the classroom. But education at its core requires the consideration of multiple narratives and varying perspectives in order to teach students how to think critically. A proper education includes the parts of our history that can be uncomfortable to some, but which define the reality of all of us. Our students deserve to learn in a classroom that fosters inclusion, representation, and open-mindedness. As a Latina who went through my entire K-12 education here in BCPS, it's really hard for me to remember a time in which I learned about my own culture or heritage other than when Latino History Month came around. And, that, and that's if it wasn't interfering with our curriculum. And I know many other students of different racial and ethnic backgrounds have felt the same way. And to say that students are learning enough about different cultures, identities, or ethnicities is not reflective of what we're seeing in our society today. But this also means we have to defend our administrators, our educators, our paraeducators, and our support staff. Never in a million years would I have imagined that one of the most important professions in our society is constantly being attacked. And we are seeing that today in the news and throughout the country. But this is the world we live in, in the era of disinformation. And we have to make sure that we are combating this everywhere we see it. We have a historic opportunity to be a role model for what education can and should look like. As we look around the country and see many boards of education threatening progress and inclusion in the classroom, we should stay wary of the, of the dangers in restricting education. I hope that this body sees our time in history as an opportunity to implement and promote policies in our education that are inclusive, tolerant, and thought-provoking for students so that they may one day take these perspectives and knowledge into the world and create the change that we so desperately need. So thank you so much for your time. 
and I hope that you all can bring this change so that our students can be those activists and create a 21st century society that is just and equitable for all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Malaya Anderson. Good evening. Good evening, board members and Dr. Williams. I'm coming to you uh, this evening as a member of the Transportation Department. I'm a bus attendant at the Providence bus lot. And I just wanted to share with the board that most of us, if not all of us in transportation, we love what we do. Um, me in particular, I have a run that's at Ridge Ruxton Elementary School that I request every year because I love those children. We feel that it's our way of giving back uh, to the students. Many of our staff, we've served uh, in Baltimore County for 20, 30, 40, some even 50 years. It's a lot of driving. But this is our dedication to safely transporting precious cargo. I would like to personally thank Dr. Williams and the board for the $1,000 retention bonus. Thank you. The $2 shift differential and the $50 attendance incentive. On a positive note, we've had a few new drivers and attendants coming to BCPS, which is always good news for us because it takes the load off of us. Although these are positive steps that we greatly appreciate, AFSCME knows that there's work to be done and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is public comment on board policy 6400, Magnet Programs, and our first speaker is Sharon Saroff. I'm back again. I am proud to say that I have two children who graduated from Baltimore County Public Schools magnet programs. Both of them attended Lansdowne High School. One received her degree it from there with a concentration in the theater and performing arts and the other one in science and engineering. We talk about equity. There are two different kinds of equity. Equity, in my case, what I'm talking about is the quality of the program, not just the students who attend. And I'll give you an example by looking at three theater programs in our, in our county. There are three theater performing arts programs, one at Patapsco, one at Lansdowne, and one at Carver. If you are lucky enough to get into Carver, you have a wide variety of classes you can learn from. You have state-of-the-art building you have more than one stage to perform on. If you go to Lansdowne, you take four classes, one each year. You have one stage that leaks every time it rains. No kidding. And you do not have access to the amount of classes that the other school has. And that's the same for Patapsco. That's what I'm talking about. We need to take a look at this policy and make sure that the policy provides equal programs in different parts of the county so that students who live in the eastern part of the county 
are getting the same access to a high class program as students in the central part of the county and the same thing for the eastern part of the county. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Bosch Verone. This is 6400 magnet programs. The discussion of the Board of Education in relation to 6400 shows how important that policy is. And I really appreciate the points. I myself, I really found the policy is good. So my comments today is basically 95% praise to the PRC. Um, and I have one minor recommendation. So under item I, or number one uh, Roman, A, the Board of Education of Baltimore County is committed to providing educational choices for parents and students. Providing educational choices. It doesn't really specify what kind of educational choices. So in the next policy, there is plenty of reference about appropriate this, appropriate that, which I really like. So my recommendation is that this policy would be modified to insert the word appropriate after providing. So it would say committed to providing appropriate educational choices for parents. And here's my thought behind it. When you put the word appropriate, the professional, which is the curriculum department, etc., they would look at the appropriate professionally based on their knowledge and experience. However, us, the customers, the public, when we look at the word appropriate, and if the school system is providing educational services that may be in conflict of what the public feels or thinks or believes, then it would be a point of discussion instead of complaining on Facebook, which I really hate and like. It makes the public into the policy. It makes them part of it. You know, again, as I stated in my earlier Roach story, we are your customers. The public is your customer. So the language needs to portray and include the public whenever it can. And I thought this would be a very simple uh, addition that hopefully would not create any in a conflict. Thank you again. Thank you. So Dr. Ferron, if you'd like to stay there, because we have Ms. Saroff and then you're up again for okay. 6402. Um, Thank you. So Ms. Saroff, you're up for 6402, Special Education Services. My favorite topic. So we are teaming up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the board would appreciate that. Um, I'm going to read verbatim from this um, policy. The Board of Education of Baltimore County is committed to the principles articulated in federal and state law regarding the provision of a free and appropriate public education. State, the protection of the rights of eligible students with disabilities and the principle that every child can learn and succeed. I'm wondering what the... Uh, definition of success in Baltimore County is for children with special needs. Um, I hope that it's not what I'm seeing, and I'll give you a for instance, um, a D in a significantly modified class is a satisfactory grade for a child with a disability. Even if that child is functioning five grade levels below where they're supposed to be. 
I've got clients on my caseload right now who fit that bill. The Board of Education is committed to providing equity and excellence in education, providing each student with an instructional environment that nurtures potential and enhances academic success. Please tell me how a child gains success when they are not even allowed access to the same classes that their non-disabled peers has access to. There are schools in this county that only provide one choice of a special, quote unquote, special. If we can't schedule our special needs kids to take music, phys ed, but we can schedule them to take art, guess what? Art is all they get for three years or four years of school. That's not equity. Board recognizes that students with disabilities should be provided with appropriate services, supports, accommodations, and modifications to address individual needs and promote student growth. How does one get that if transportation is making the decisions as to where children attend programs? And that is something that is happening. If the Office of Transportation is not willing to extend a route so a child can go to an appropriate program, they get stuck in a program that may not be so appropriate. We need to align our policies to state and federal government policies, not make them up as we go along. Thank you. Dr. Ferran? Good evening again. The policy 6402 is good. However, I have these comments. Under item A, regarding the provision of a free, appropriate public education. I know I believe this is a law, F-A-P-E, I believe, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. However, as public myself, I really wish that there is like an asterisk where you would, in the bottom of the policy, you would define the word appropriate. Because appropriate, as my central council has already made the comments to you, is an elastic word. It can be interpreted in different ways. The other part that I really object to, and I know neither you nor I has a hand on free, there is nothing really free. We pay taxes. Okay, so I know you have to put it in there, but it's not really free. I'm concerned about the additions that central to this commitment is a review of budgetary requests and board advocacy for funding. It sounds to me, I'm not sure this is complex for me as a physician, it sounds to me that if the money is available, then you would do it or something of that sort. Um, I, I just don't think it's clear enough, at least for me as a non-educator person. In the next paragraph, item B, line number 16, the board provides, and then there is a bracket, and it's open to the right side. And then three words after that, there is another bracket, and it's open to the right side. It sounds like a typo but nonetheless, I want to bring that to your attention. And that is my comment, thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Bruce Aides. Good evening. Good evening. Recently, the board met in its quasi-judicial capacity to hear oral arguments, deliberate, and render decisions in two appeals. Those were cases HE 22-10 and HE 22-12. Now would be an appropriate time to affirm the votes taken on those appeals. Thank you. 
May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 2210 and 2212 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So, so moved, Matt. Second row. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose. Favor six. So. Mr. Mercedes, so the motion fails. Ms. Causey's motion. Have we heard from all the we board members? We have not members? heard from all the board members that are technically present. Okay. Uh, maybe we present. should uh, entertain a motion to table this until uh, so moved. the others are here. Second. Second. Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gilbert, on the motion to table? Yes. Ms. Rowe second. made the motion. Mr. Offerman, second. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Table. Table. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion yeah. carries. Okay. And now I see that we have uh, one board member returning and another virtually who appears to be on the phone. Uh, maybe we can uh, take the vote again to approve the board's Let's prior vote on these two appeals. Let's try that again. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 2210 and 2212 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Mac. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. <coughs> Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott? Sorry, yes. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Favor is eight. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. The next item on the agenda is the update on the efficiency and effectiveness review, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Yes, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Charlie Green and Dr. Yarbrough to please come forward. So good evening, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. Tonight, I present update number six, a clear path forward, our system plan to address needs outlined in the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review. Our plan is aligned with the blueprint for Maryland's future with the goal of positioning Baltimore County Public Schools as a premier school system. My goal is to provide an update on our progress with respect to assessing, adopting, and implementing recommendations outlined in the 759-page report. We will continue to update the board, our community, and Team BCPS during this time of change. Our partnership is critical to ensuring high-quality services to the students, staff, and families of Baltimore County. Next slide. 
and we know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. Each and every day we are seeing signs of the next normal and all point towards continued healing. Next slide. So as you know, a 759-page review of our school system requires a balanced and steady approach for successful implementation. This slide shows the three types of groups that have been involved in reviewing and assessing the recommendation in each chapter. The first group, division work group, work groups. The second one, blueprint review team, and the third is stakeholder work group. On March 8th, our deputy superintendent provided an overview of the status of the efficiency review. Tonight, I invite Dr. Yarbrough to provide an additional update that details our current status, FY23 budget items, and implementation and forecast future actions. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good evening, Board Chair Hinn, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. On September 14th, Dr. Williams committed to the following outcomes related to the efficiency review report. Next slide, please. Thank you. Significant cost savings focused on operational efficiency, a reorganization of central office staff to ensure the effective and efficient provision of services to schools, and a comprehensive collaborative plan to improve staff morale, communication, and stakeholder satisfaction. To date, items one and two have been completed, and item number three is in progress. The comprehensive climate and communications plan will be shared at the next board meeting. Responsible cost reductions in the amount of $7.7 .7 million have already been completed. These savings include a reduction of 9.0 FTEs, totaling $1.7 million through the reorganization of cabinet and $6 million through device cost reductions. Next slide, please. This slide categorizes the type of recommendations in each chapter. The 197 recommendations include work directly related to divisions across DCPS, personnel reorganization items, policy changes, Board of Education items, and the category other, which includes items related to the survey results, climate, metrics, and communication. Next sli slide, please. The overall rate of implementation for efficiency review recommendations that the Public Works LLC project director has led averages 80% across school districts, as highlighted on page 19 of the report. As of March 19th, 175 recommendations have a final determination. BCPS, has moved forward 88% or 153 items with a yes. This number exceeds e implementation average by 8%. 10% have moved forward with a no, and 2% or four items with a determination to hold for further review and consideration in FY24. 22 items are pending division work groups and Board of Education review. 16 and 6, respectively. Next slide, please. In addition to the $7.7 .7 million savings that have already been actualized, 24 recommendations were targeted in the report for the FY23 budget. Six items, or 26%, were efficiencies, meaning they included enhanced processes or renaming of departments. 13 items, or 56% of the recommendations, were efficiencies with associated costs. These items included additional positions and stipends. Two items identified additional savings through the elimination of additional positions. And the last two items were classified as other. They were specific to different aspects of the morale plan. Next slide, please. Of the 24 recommendations, 
identified for FY23. 18 items have been moved forward with a yes or yes with modifications. Modifications include, but are not limited to, updating the type of positions in alignment with the current needs and timelines to match blueprint funding. Two items have moved forward with a no. One item is pending division work group review. And three items have been held for further review in consideration in FY24 based on new structures and programs being implemented now, including our new evaluation system, PERFORM, and our new data warehouse, Performance Matters. The current status of the 19 remaining items is four of the items have been completed, 14 are in progress, and one is pending. Next slide, please. As of March 19th, 149 recommendations have a designated implementation status. This slide provides a summary. 39 items have been completed in totality. 97 items are in progress. What does it mean to be in progress? For the majority of this, these items, it means that divisions are revising standard operating procedures, they are creating enhanced processes, and or collaborating with external partners as recommended by the report. 13 items have a start date between April and July, eight and five respectively. The final report will include a detailed description of each recommendation and the associated timeline. Next slide, please. As a reminder, members of the public can view the Efficiency Report Implementation webpage to access artifacts related to system review and implementation. It is dynamic and will continue to change as materials and artifacts become available. The final report will be posted on this page later this spring in the upcoming weeks. Next slide, please. In the next efficiency update, we will provide a comprehensive overview of our climate and morale plan as well as our system-wide communication enhancements informed by the recent communication survey of BCPS students, staff, and communities. The BCPS Climate and Morale Plan has been collaboratively developed in partnership with all union presidents, focus groups including non-represented staff, and external partners in alignment with the efficiency report. Major components of the plan include organizational climate, engagement, recognition, and wellness. Thank you for your time and attention. I turn it back over to Dr. Williams to share information about the BCPS response to ensuring safe and supportive environments. Next slide, please. So yes, continuing that theme of climate um, and uh, morale. Last fall, we began our community town halls in response to the needs of our school communities. So in total, we have held four town halls where we've heard from parents, survey our principals about safety needs, work with student leaders to launch a peer-to-peer -peer campaign, equipped our PTSA with tools to support their local schools, and conducted several school safety walks. In April, we will host a multi-district roundtable meeting with five neighboring school systems to share ideas related to school safety. Based on these opportunities to listen and learn, we have developed a course of action to ensure ongoing supports for our school communities. At our next board meeting, I will share detailed information about this plan. The key elements include grant-funded student safety assistance at the secondary level, enhanced community partnership opportunities, revamp uh, processes and procedures, excuse me, to effectively communicate outcomes related to bullying and harassment investigations, and a widespread information campaign to promote the use of the Maryland Center for School Safety reporting tip line. 
So I would like to thank all members of Team BCPS for your partnership and collaboration on this very important topic. I think that concludes uh, our update. Thank you. Board members, questions? Comments? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, I know that, and I, and I think it was in our last efficiency review update, there was a lot of conversation about passport. And I've been hearing a lot of information from the community that it's something that they want to maintain. So I'm wondering, can you provide more specific details about the passport program, what the efficiency, efficiency review's recommendations were and what's currently under, underway? And you might have discussed this last meeting, but I just wanted to make sure I understand. So our passport is our world languages in elementary. The recommendation from Public Works was to eliminate the program. Uh, we felt that we should not do that because we okay. have students who may be in fourth or fifth grade, first or second year. And I put on the document during our budget workshop consideration. Mm -hmm. That was a significant savings. As you recall, that was a part of chapter eight of the Public Works. And that was an expansion. I just want to remind the board, the original Public Works plan was looking at operations, and then they expanded to Chapter 8, which involved our academic program. So that was a recommendation. Um, and there was also a recommendation to look at um, an immersion program, um, a little bit of history. And Dr. Boswell McComas will correct me. We've had that, an immersion, pr immersion program, and converted to our PYP program all aligned with IB. So that's why some of these recommendations, many of these recommendations, if not all, we had to make them our own and look at what existed in the system to make informed decision. And so um, I put that as a consideration. We could phase it out over time if, if but we're having those, you heard speakers today about increasing more world languages. Right. So, so that was a consideration um, that I offered, but at this time we've, we have taken no action on that. Okay, thank you, and that's really good to hear. Um, just in conversation, when I was at a Bear Creek Elementary School, Lions Mill, uh, Fedonia International just the other day, I know the importance of passports, so I just wanted to make sure that we are still continuing with that, so thank you for sharing that. Yes, Ms. Mack, did you have a question? Yes, um, I have a very quick question. I'm trying to look at the numbers on slide nine and then slide six. So slide six has a total number of efficiency review recommendations of 197. And then slide nine is a, a breakout of 149 of those. What is the difference? Like, if I had had more time, I could have figured it out, but I'm sure you know. Yes, yeah, so this, uh, the recommendations that are missing, um, you have the recommendations that were a no. Uh, those are omitted, as well as the recommendations that are back to the division work group um, for review. You have the recommendations for the Board of Education, and I believe the you've, we should have maybe four left, and those four might be the four for FY24. But I would have to go back and double check. You don't have to. I, I knew there was a, a, an answer, but I just couldn't figure it out quickly enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, board members? Okay. Ms. Causey? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for the uh, presentation. Um, there was a uh, document that was discussed in the operating budget work sessions related to um, recommendations that are being postponed until fiscal year 24 um, that had dollar values associated with them. And I, that document was supposed to be attached to board docs and I was looking for it, but I could not find it. So I'm requesting if staff could figure that out. Since it was discussed in an open meeting, it should be available on board docs. Um, if I may respond, I, I think you're talking about the addendum that was a part of the work session that we had that was very specific regarding the, the efficiency, and it's my understanding that was attached. Um, but we'll go back and back to the notes, and I'll work with Ms. Gover just to confirm that. Sure, and if you could just update us, that, that would be great, because we had a number of work sessions. So, um, 
So my one question is, um, what additional resources are being provided to the board office in it to assist with the implementation of the board, the board's uh, recommendations? Because as we know, the board office is only staffed with one uh, individual, and um, there's a lot of work to be done. So, so thank you for that question. That was a part of your um, amendment to the board to the FY23 budget. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, um, that has been shared, and we're just waiting for our county executive to present his budget. Um, and then we will wait for the May meeting in which the county council will approve, and then we would amend based on what we hear from the outcome of that meeting. Okay, so does that mean there's not any staffing resources that are available in terms of um, assisting the board before then? I mean, for instance- Well, let me suggest that the board, maybe the full board may wanna have a conversation around chapter one. There are several recommendations that were ex that uh, pertain to the board, and I would offer that that may be a follow-up. If I recall the last update that was made uh, regarding chapter one specific to the board um, was in October or November of 2021. So that might be some next steps. And I can also speak to that, Dr. Williams. So some of those recommendations are also being addressed in committee as appropriate for each committee. Budget is addressing them, PRC is addressing them. So we are also facilitating the work through committee as appropriate and trying to um, address those along with the regular work of the committee. So um, those chairs have been doing an excellent job at working that in with the regular work of the board as well. So until those resources are made available, we are moving forward with the recommendations that we can. Okay, thank you. And I know Policy Review Committee uh, has been working on that and the liaison and staff have been um, very helpful. And we've seen has uh, budgets. evidence on the website and in board docs. The other question I have is um, Public Works has an implementation plan. And I'm just curious if this document could be updated with the status of this information, which is helpful. Uh, and I went on the page, the efficiency review page, but there's like 37 different minutes that speak to each recommendation. So just as an overall guide that uh, we could understand and the public could understand. Sure, I will also say, I wanna commend the team for making a website and making everything transparent. Um, that you can always go back and review. And as was reported, we will, find, we will present the overall final report that would be aligned with the recommendations um, put forth by Public Works. So we appreciate your uh, feedback, Ms. Causey, and uh, uh, we're wrapping this report up. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So I'll go to Ms. Rowe and then I'll um, go around the dais and to our remote board members and, and make sure anyone who has a question has the opportunity. Ms. Rowe? I just want to go back to the passport program for a second. Um, what was Public Works reasoning behind why they wanted us to get rid of it? Did they want us to get rid of, like, surely they didn't mean get rid of all the foreign languages. No, it was specific around the passport program at the elementary school level. Okay, okay and so, and just I, so just to remind the board, these are recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, and as you see, there's several of them that I chose not to move forward. Now, Dr. Boswell McComas is an advocate for her programs and all of our programs. So we've had those conversations. So just because they made the recommendation and a part of the process, I get to comment and provide feedback. Um, we can go back to the 759 page and look at their rationale because every recommendation they provided their rationale or suggestion, um, not that we have to agree with it. So Ms. Rowe, I don't have the, the document in front of me to go back and look at the, the rationale. Okay, so I just want to make it clear that it doesn't make sense to me the way we've always taught languages because the elementary school age learn the languages fastest because that's when their brain's intuitive to grasp language, that we wait till middle school and high school to start teaching foreign languages. And I just would like to see us actually 
do more in elementary school with foreign languages, not less. And I just want to make sure we're not moving in that direction of doing less. Well, that's kind of advocating for keeping the passport program and the rationale for starting in elementary. So thank you, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you, Ms. Penn. Um, I wanted to know, because it was mentioned several times about the board and in um, this presentation, which Dr. Williams, um, you yourself did a, a great presentation um, showing us um, uh, th this um, uh, rollout of, of how you're going to go forward. So that leads me to my question as far as um, Ms. Ms. Hen and, and the board. Um, I, I heard you, Ms. Hen, say that there are things that the board is working on committee in committee to um, take the recommendations from the Operational Efficiency Review Report. Um, I would like to know when are we going to have a presentation or something showing how um, which suggestions we're taking and how they're being implemented. Um, there were quite a few starting on page 59 but ways that we can work as a more productive board, uh, findings as far as um, trainings, um, parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules, um, learning how the board can orientate itself to its role, and um, less micromanagement. Just if you can answer that for me, um, when are we going to have a presentation or report on the recommendations that the board is applying? That will be added to an upcoming agenda item, Ms. Scott. I don't have the date in front of me. So there is not been a date set? Correct, and as Ms. Causey mentioned, we are awaiting a resource to assist the board with that endeavor. And I, had, I indicated that those committees are working on those items and are in progress. So there, thank you for that, because there are several things that would not require a committee. Um, one of them was parliamentary procedure. Um, it was, uh, another one was a social media guideline for board members. Um, and we currently have a, have a, have a, um, something that we could address that. But um, the one with parliamentary procedure was the board chair should complete a parliamentary procedure course. Um, I, there are things in here that we as a board could be addressing and speaking about that wouldn't require a committee and wouldn't necessarily have to be done um, in specific committee. So um, I was just curious about that. Thank you. Mr. McMillian and I will... Um work with Dr. Williams and provide an update at the next meeting. Thank you. Um, Ms. Joes, do you have any questions or comments? Ms. Joes? Dr. Hager? Um, I don't, I was just looking at the website though. Thank you for putting that all together. It's really nice and I appreciate the work that you've done. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Offerman? None at this time. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Thomas, any other questions or comments? No, I just wanted to say thank you to the staff for this presentation, for all the work at the efficiency review, and I think that the implementation has been incredible so far. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? No, thank you. Thank you. And I will add, I appreciate the efforts on the website. There's a lot of information out there. Um, I will add to Mrs. Causey's comment, it would be helpful to see the status of each recommendation in one place in a, I'm going to use the term dashboard, but I don't need anything that fancy, but one table of the recommendations with the status of each would be helpful to see, but I certainly appreciate all of the work that's gone into it and all of the work of the various committees, so thank you very much. Thank you. On the way. Mrs. Causey? I just had one quick question. When I was reviewing the... Um, web page and all of the different meeting minutes. The work groups, many of them were established, I believe, in October. And since then, we've had some significant um, employee um, changes, including the addition of new ch chiefs per the recommendations. So I wondered if any of the work groups are going to be updated with um, new staff uh, for whom reviewing these types of recommendations might be helpful. Thank you for that question. Uh, many of the work groups have completed their work. Um, except those 16 that have to go back because the stakeholders sent them back through, uh, for further consideration um, purposefully to keep the work closest to the people that are doing the work. We didn't have any chiefs on the work group. And so with the central office reorganization, the new positions doesn't impact the composition of the group. But certainly if there are any people who were promoted or moved to another department, we definitely um, you know, made sure that we uh, sought that feedback to 
uh, replace them to have someone uh, give that critical uh, input. Okay, thank, so thank you. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you, and Ms. Mack, did you have anything else? I have nothing yeah. further, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe, anything you else wanted to add? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Scott, I believe, had one more question. I'm sorry. Ms. Scott, did you have yes. another? Yes, thank you. Yes, certainly. Um, just an additional question or comment. Um, when you said like a status update um, for uh, the updates as they come in one place, I would like to see one of those as well as for the board recommendations because there were some pretty serious recommendations in there that go to our governance and or, or lack thereof. And I would like to see the updates um, simultaneously shown next to the um, ones that the system is doing that show what we've addressed, how we've addressed it, and how it's being addressed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. If, if I may comment, um, the report, the 197 recommendations, um, eight chapters, they not only talk about the operations side, but they also mentioned, to, mentioned some aspect of the board. So maybe prudent that we have the complete picture in totality than piecemealing it. Again, we're, we're prepared to, to finish this report since September, and I'm sure the work groups are ready to, to wrap it up as well. So I would just say to the, to the board, we're planning to provide another update um, but I will work with board leadership. The next update should include the totality of everything. And so I appreciate what you said working with Mr. McMillian and board leadership um, versus us placing our piece up there and there's the incomplete information. That's all I'm saying, to have the totality then sure. piecemeal. But that's something we can discuss. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on second quarter results. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas, Mr. Connolly, and Dr. Almendorf. So good evening, board. I know uh, Dr. Boswell McComas will start us off, but I just want to remind us that um, a part of your goals, a part of our strategic plan, and a part of our presentations, uh, we've been providing updates about how our students are doing. Um, we, we thank you for your patience, because sometimes these presentations and the Q&A can go on. But I love the fact that what we are modeling is what happens in the school building with school leaders in terms of data analysis. It paints just one picture of how our students are doing. And keep in mind, our students um, are, are transitioning to this next normal, uh, especially what happened last year and the year before. And so, yes, I want all of our students to have um, grades of C or higher. Yes, I want them to have a four or five um, on a national assessment, but we also know these types of presentations, and I said it last before, I guarantee were never presented uh, prior to my arrival. It's not because of me as the superintendent, it's because of the team. These folks work daily to try to make better outcomes for students, and that's why we always have the perspective of center office and school base to let you have a glimpse of what happens in the day-to-day -day operation. It doesn't tell the whole picture, because if Mr. Martin here, and thank you, Mr. Martin, for being here, if he were to tell the whole picture, we would be here all night. So I just want to thank this team and others for presenting, and I want to thank this board, because every time we talk about academic achievement, it's fun to watch you all transition into what I used to see as a principal and what I do on our cabinet level. We have these, these debates. We ask these questions. We may not have the answer. We're going to find the answer. But today, we're going to talk about our second quarter, building upon what we did before. And before I go on, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bosma McComas to start. Thank so you. thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Good evening, Ms. Hen, uh, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. I'm um, 
Dr. Mary McComas, the Chief Academic Officer, and I'm joined this evening. I'm going to quickly introduce my colleagues here. Uh, immediately to my right, we have Dr. Um, Elmendorf. We have uh, Mr. Martin, princi proud principal of Newtown High School. Um, Ms. Joseph, uh, our executive director of Newtown High School, and on the end, Mr. Conley um, from our Department of um, Research and Accountability. So thank you for giving me that, that moment. And thank you so much, Dr. Williams, because we are excited to be here this giving evening. Giving you all time to transition and get in your seats. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Um, so with no further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. You know, every day in our K-12, uh, schools, our leaders create spaces for our students to, to learn in a safe and supportive environment and to achieve academically and to prepare for their future. As educators, we must find, evaluate, and use data to determine if their daily efforts result in the intended outcomes for our students. And our first quarter uh, period report was presented to you in December. And moving forward, quarterly metrics reports will be produced at the conclusion of each marking period and will focus on three notable indicators of student success, attendance, suspensions, and grades. And this evening, we will present the second quarter. Um, next slide, please. As we know, all of our work, I'm sorry, could you go back one? Thank you. All of our work is anchored, of course, in our strategic plan, the Compass, our pathway to excellence. And it does provide for us a system-wide focus on raising our bar, closing our gap, and preparing students for their future. Our dedication to ensuring that our students do graduate college and career right is our thoughtful and research-based approach to understanding the key metrics of student progress. Um, and as mentioned, attendance, suspension, and course performance data inform our decisions as we um, advocate for equity and student access and opportunities. And this is just one example of how our strategic plan, the Compass, intentionally raises the bar, closes gaps, and prepares our students for their future. As a follow-up to the first marking period, this report was developed to provide updated quarterly results and progress over time. The report does provide insight into our student progress and climate conditions at the system level by student group and for students also participating in the VLP. The purpose is to use data as a flashlight to ask our questions uh, in order to make informed collaborative decisions to support our students and our staff. Next slide, please. Academic achievement is the current level of student progress as indicated by multiple measures, including classroom, district, and external assessments that evaluate student learning. Key elements of improving achievement include these three interdependent components in the instructional core, specifically teacher knowledge and skill, our student engagement, and content. You, the board, and our school system work together to ensure that we create these conditions for student success, and to do that, we must engage in the examination of the written, taught, and assessed curriculum. Throughout the year, instructional leadership teams examine school performance based on their targeted work, and in professional learning communities, our teachers and our school leaders use actionable data to make instructional decisions to raise achievement and prepare every student for success. Each of these components shown for academic achievement promote the effectiveness of the written, taught, and assessed curriculum through standards-based, high-quality first instruction, combined with best practices in teaching and learning pedagogy, focused professional learning, and targeted resource allocation, feedback and support to our schools, and ultimately data-informed continuous improvement in initiatives. Next, I'll have Mr. Conley share with you um, exactly where our data is for the second quarter. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Next slide, please. As previously shared with the Board of Education during our first semester attendance report, the trend in decreasing attendance rates from marking period one to marking period two are consistent with historical attendance data trends. Typically, seasonal illnesses result in decreased attendance during the second marking period. It is important to note that the Omicron surge took place during marking period two and attendance rates were adversely impacted as transmission rates increased. Promoting high attendance rates for all students is an important part of the growth and achievement over time and a critical factor in having access to the compass pathways to success for college, career, and service. Our Board of Education has identified specific attendance goals as a part of the focus on safe and supportive learning environments. The National Center for Educational S Statistics notes students who attend school regularly have been shown to achieve at higher levels than students who do not have regular attendance. The homeschool partnership is critical to support student attendance. 
the chart shown displays the elementary school attendance rate by zone for the first and second marking period. Historical data trends from marking period one to marking period two are evident in the slight drop in attendance across zones. Next slide, please. The chart shown displays the middle school attendance rate by zone for the first and second marking period. Overall, middle schools had decreased attendance from the first to the second marking period. Periodic surges of the COVID-19 variants may have resulted in fluctuations in attendance, as well as the historical trends of decreased attendance rates from marking period one to marking period two. Next slide, please. And this chart displays the high school attendance rate by zone for the first and second marking period. For all three zones, high school attendance decreased from marking period one to marking period two. As previously shared, during our first semester attendance presentation, pre-pandemic attendance rates from 2017 to 2020 show an approximate 3% decrease from marking period one to marking period two. The impact of the COVID-19 global pandemic has resulted in a more significant decrease in high school student attendance rates. Next slide, please. Thank you. System-wide, the suspension rate for all students was less than 2.18% during marking periods one and two. Student suspension rates by grade level for marking periods one and two are displayed in the charts shown. The overall suspension <coughs> rates are comparable to the pre-pandemic COVID-19 um, 1920 suspension rate data by school level for marking periods one and two. The suspension rates for elementary and high school students decreased in the current school year compared to the 1920 school year. While in contrast, middle school uh, have had increased suspension rate during the same period. School teams and central office support staff implement a variety of preventative, responsive, and restorative practices to support positive student behavior and safe and supportive learning environments. Prevention involves proactive school-wide strategies, such as the BCPS Code of Conduct, character education, conscious discipline, and positive behavior interventions and supports. Responsive strategies are an additional layer of support to students incorporated across the school environment and flexible in use. School supports may include peer mentors, staff mentors, therapeutic services, student support teams, and pupil personnel services. Logical consequences are followed when student behavior warrants disciplinary action, and restorative practices work to improve and repair relationships while reestablishing expectations to maintain a safe and supportive learning environment for students and staff. Next slide, please. The elementary school course grade distribution chart is displayed as two marking periods of data. At the elementary level, letter grades begin in fourth grade. The top half displays the percent of students in grades four and five earning a course grade of A through E for social studies, science, math, and ELA for marking period two, while the bottom half displays the same data for marking period one. As shown, a greater percentage of students earned A's and B's in marking period two across all core subjects compared to marking period one. For both marking periods, the percentage of students earning a C or better in elementary school was over 89% across all core subject areas. Next slide, please. The middle school course grade distribution chart is displayed, again, as two marking periods of grades, A through E, for social studies, science, math, and ELA. As shown, a greater percentage of students earned A's and B's in the first marking period for social studies, science, and ELA. For math, a slightly greater percentage of students earned A's and B's in the second marking period. For both marking periods in middle school, the percentage of students earning a C or better was at or above 75% for all core subject areas. Next slide, please. The high school course grade distribution chart is displayed as two marking periods of grades, just as we've shown for elementary and middle school. As shown, a greater percentage of students earned A's or B's in the first marking period across the core subject areas. For both marking periods, the percentage of students earning a C or better was greater than 66% of all high school students. Next, Dr. McComas, 
will share with us how the central offices provide support to schools. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, attendance is essential, as we all know, for ac our student academic success. And at our February um, 22nd board meeting, we shared tiered levels of support or intervention relating to attendance. Um, we implement a comprehensive and multi-tiered system of support to improve our student attendance. And displayed on the screen are the attendance uh, systems of support from um, BCPS, which is utilized by our school uh, co uh, committees to help guide their work relating to attendance. And as previously shared, our school teams and central office support implement a variety of preventative, responsive, and restorative practices to support positive student behavior and safe and supportive learning environments. Our system improvement team work group uh, focused on suspensions analyzes our school system suspension data to, to determine which schools are in need of individualized support in the areas of climate and culture. Next slide, please. In addition to the supports provided to increase student attendance, engagement, and positive behavior, our central office team uh, also work in collaboration with schools to identify strategies and resources to support instructional growth. Specifically, our content offices have developed um, curricular resources to support learning acceleration at point of use in the curriculum. These resources help our teachers to prioritize the content standards and to provide rich instructional experiences for our students to address any unfinished learning and to reteach concepts based on current instructional data. We also provide professional learning for our school-based administrators and instructional leaders on best practices for responding to data in real time. For example, our math team has worked collaboratively with our schools to identify students who have not yet met with success in Algebra 1, and they have developed a variety of strategies for schools to provide what we call in-time recovery using a push-pull or pace model as illustrated on the screen in front of you. From the school perspective, we are uh, previously, we previously shared, excuse me, from um, marking period one, how this work is operationalized at our elementary level. Um, for this evening's presentation, we're very excited to have Ms. Kiria Joseph, our Secondary Executive Director, and Mr. James Martin, uh, proud principal of Newtown High School, uh, here to share strategies for how high schools continue to work uh, to prepare our students um, as they, um, as we prepare them for college, career, and military service. So at this time, I'll hand the presentation over to Ms. Joseph. Okay, thank you, Mary. In the Department of Schools, uh, we work with principals and leadership teams to use performance matters for data analysis of standards. Uh, we collaborate with the Division of Curriculum and Instruction to maximize the school's access to appropriate interventions and accelerated learning to promote student achievement. We identify and ensure implementation of the differentiated supports to each school. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing Principal James Martin of Newtown High School for the academic supports his admin team, teachers, and staff are implementing to help students achieve. Newtown High School was one of our high schools that outperformed BCPS for grades of a C or higher for the second marking period. We are clear that 70% is not our goal. Our goal is 100% and we have work to do. Principal Martin will highlight key instructional supports to ensure his students continue to demonstrate growth in all academic areas. Next slide, please. Excuse me, Ms. Joseph. This is the slide that Ms. Joseph was speaking to. If we go to the next slide, that will be for Newtown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and, and greetings. As the proud principal of Newtown High School, it is an honor to highlight the success of our wonderful students, teachers, and administrators at our school. The beginning of our school year began with the theme and focus, attend, achieve, and accelerate. Our instructional leadership team has partnered with our BCPS DRAA to receive continuous professional development on how to analyze student data in order to provide strategies to our staff to increase student content knowledge. Newtown High School uses various forms of data to drive instruction, from previous MCAP trend data to BCPS Schoology to the new Performance Matters program. Performance Matters helps our leadership team and teachers analyze student successes as well as current content deficits which enables teachers to develop strategies to accelerate learning. 
When walking through Newtown High School, you may visit a classroom and you may see an activity such as Desmos being implemented to teach content standards. This gives the ability to provide responsive instruction to a class or individual student to address current deficit skills. Next slide, please. An additional way that Newtown High School supports student acceleration with our Titan is our Titan tutoring program. Students involved in the Titan tutoring program are members of an organization that serves students' academic success while addressing their SEL, social emotional learning needs. Through the design small group instruction that takes place on campus, instructors utilize time to review student data, set goals, support below average performing students, teach or reteach, and remediate instruction. The team also uses data points to target supports based on students and their various needs. The tutor, the tutor program collectively integrates academics, personal development, and SEL practices with the goal of general self-management. Instructors will develop and set both curricular and instructional objectives to maintain account accountability to students, retention, and growth. Our program allows students to redo assignments to give them the opportunity to improve mastery on content standards. We not only owe our success to our hardworking students, but also recognize the hard work of our counselors, paraeducators, additional assistants, teachers, assistant principals, and office support, which we call our Super Six. In closing, we are excited about our 70% of achieving C or better, but we continue and won't forget about the 30% who did not make it. Newtown High School is striving for 100%. Thank you. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, Principal Martin. Attendance rates in the VLP have decreased slightly, but continue to hover around 90%, which is aligned with system-wide attendance rates. Understanding that attendance in a virtual setting looks different than that of our brick and mortar school environments, VLP staff regularly communicated with families about the importance of attendance from the beginning of the school year. Next slide, please. The course performance findings for the VLP continue to reflect a transition to a brand new learning environment in which staff and students are working hard to adapt to the unique characteristics and expectations of a comprehensive online learning program. The percentage of students earning a C or better in high school mathematics has increased from 52.6% to 55.3%. The percentage of students earning a C or better decreased in high school English and decreased in math and English for the other two levels. The VLP faculty and staff continue to refine their abilities to positively impact student attendance and course performance, including targeted professional growth activities for VLP teachers. Tutoring programs have recently been implemented at all three levels to focus on identified skills and content. The VLP has been successful in meeting its primary goal of providing a comprehensive full-time virtual environment for students who desired and or needed this option in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, while many students have met with success in the VLP, we know that a full-time virtual option is not the best learning environment for all types of learners. As health metrics continue to improve, VLP staff is working with families of students who continue to struggle in the virtual environment to determine if returning to in-person learning might be the best path forward for some of our learners. Next slide, please. As we navigate the second semester of the first year of the virtual learning program, we wanna share how two VLP high school students have demonstrated growth since the beginning of the school year. One 10th grader earned ease in most of her courses in the first semester. After working with the school counseling team and content teachers, she was able to identify that time management in a virtual environment was something with which she was having significant difficulty. The team worked with her to identify and implement strategies to address this concern. She has currently submitted all assignments for the second semester and is earning an A or B in the vast majority of her courses. Another high school student was also earning mostly ease in the first semester until a particular meeting with his case manager and teachers in which he was able to identify the fact that he was uncomfortable asking questions in a virtual environment and was also struggling with COVID-related concerns outside of the school at his home. 
after a sec separate Google Meet was designed to create a more personalized environment for asking questions and addressing social emotional needs, the student has submitted all assignments and is earning a high C. The VLP staff continues to refine their ability to identify and implement the individualized supports students need to be successful. Next, Dr. McComas will share information about our academic achievement reports. Next slide, please. And on the screen before you is our schedule of academic reports. <laughs> this slide and the next one uh, walk us all the way through to the end of the summer. So thank you. This concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. Board members, any questions? Dr. Hager and then Mr. Offerman. Thank you all so much. Um, I have just a few questions. Um, one I've asked before and I don't recall the answer exactly, is, is a D grade passing in our school system? You can pass with a D, yeah. is that, that is correct? It, yes, that is correct. All right, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so uh, with respect to the suspension data, um, so I saw that we compared quarter one to quarter two, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, discipline and, and behavior issues in, in schools right now. Do, the, do these data compare similarly to our pre-pandemic data as far as the rates of suspension from quarter one to quarter two historically? So I believe Mr. Connolly had that in his talking points, but I'll turn it over to him. I see he has his microphone. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. McComas. And thank you for the question. Um, I did uh, pull out some additional data to share because I anticipated this question. And um, you know, on a comparable level, from 1920, the first two marking periods were pre-COVID. You know, COVID didn't happen until um, yes. in the third quarter. So we we're looking at just, just a correction: um, 2019 to 2020, not 1920. Oh, I'm year. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so with the 1920 flappers. was also yeah. pre-COVID. So. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Williams. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, the K to five, quarter one, quarter two, was actually less um, in 21, 22 than in 19, 20, um, respectively in, in school year 19 to, to 2020. Um, 0.47 and 0.54 were the K to five suspension rates. And in 2021 and 2022, the quarter one and quarter two suspension rates were 0.33 and 0.45. For um, high schools, we also saw a decrease. In the 2019-2020 school year, we had for quarter one and quarter two, 2.59% and 3.27% respectively. And for the 2021-2022 school year, we had 2.44 and 2.85% respectively. In middle school, we did uh, mention how uh, we went up you know, from mark period one to mark period two, but also from the 2019 to the 2020 school year. Um, it was 2.92% and 4.07%. And in 2021, 2022, we had 4.41% and 4.56%. I, I, I think I followed that. So it sounds like um, it typically does go up between quarter one and two. Yes, anyway, yes, yes. That and, like and that's also accurate for you know, pre historical data. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Shifting gears, and slides 11 to 13 talked about different supports that are in place. Are these all new supports post-pandemic, or are these things we've been doing for a number of years? So I can go for um, the information for the Department of Schools. We have typically done that, but what is new is how we're using the Performance Matters, um, doing the professional development with our leadership teams, and really now we can pinpoint down to deficit skill by student, um, that information in which teachers can then use that to really target and reteach that skill. So that is something new, that access that we have there for the performance map. Okay, and are, are people are using it? Yes, we are, we are actively uh, using it, um, our principals, but, but now we're down, our teachers, our department chairman um, are using that information so that every decision that we're making is a, is a data informed decision um, and we're able to highlight uh, some of the things that we were able to highlight tonight to really pinpoint what is it that we're doing that is actually working in some of our That's fantastic thank you mm -hmm. um, and last uh, Dr. Williams I really appreciate having the, the school level perspective in these meetings I just want to thank you for inclu including that and uh, so to Principal Martin what is the best thing that you've done this year that's new that you hope to continue doing um, I believe the best thing 
that I offered or that we do at Newtown is being able to really um, hone in on standards and giving students opportunities to really master those standards. Um, when we talk about our tutoring program, um, we have a great number of students that enjoy um, the SEL, building relationships, but also really mastering standards that they may, might not have received the first time around. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Yes, this question may be uh, slightly, uh, slightly off this report, but I'm very interested in what happens when a student gets suspended in terms of what, uh, what, uh, what measures are taken to make sure that he doesn't fall further behind uh, in terms of academics. Okay. So when a student is suspended, we always communicate with the teachers. Um, we provide the work that they um, may miss while they're out. Um, ultimately, we try to um, introduce them to, of course, our tutoring program and other sources um, just to, uh, you know, uh, be able to discover or find those deficits that they may have missed while they're out. How about, uh, how about system-wide? Is that, is, that, is that what's going on in a lot of places? Yeah, so that's one of the benefits of the ESSER grants that we have and the tutoring grant specifically that uh, our schools each have the capacity to help design tutoring and support programs. Rather, that's a student who may be out for disciplinary purposes or a student who, frankly, just needs additional supports. So I'm going to ask um, Ms. Joseph to respond, not because she was a former principal, middle and high, but because of her role as, the, as one of our secondary executive directors that she can talk about what happens across the system. Ms. Sure. Joseph. So yes, those are the things that happen. Um, and like Dr. McComas said, what we're able to do, um, especially virtually, um, we're able to have tutors connect with, with students virtually sometimes when they, when they are on the short-term suspension. Um, and then when they come back, there's an opportunity to use some of those uh, programs. So that happens throughout. Each school does use their own touch. Um, in terms of how they do that, but that is the expectation during that time. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? So I have a few questions. Um, so on pages um, 8, 9, and 10 of the PowerPoint, there's a number of percentage of students that receive an E. What happens um, at the end of the year if they still have an E? So one of the things that uh, we're doing, and this is how Performance Matters helps, we try to make sure that before the end of the marking period, we're identifying those students. But like for the students that have an E, schools have already identified who those students are. They're encouraging them to do a coach class. They're encouraging them to um, actually partake in the tutoring. Some are doing SST, which is our support team meetings to actually begin to see. So right now is a critical time, especially if we looked at their first marking period and their second marking period. On the high school level, um, we're about credits. So sometimes um, we're looking at um, our EDLP programs, if they need enrichment that way so that they have the credit recovery as well. So um, in high school, I know if they, if they don't complete the grade satisfactory that they just won't get the credits for that course and they'll have to take it over but what happens for elementary and middle school if the child persistently gets to the end of year and has an e um, so we um, also have um, our summer pro our summer program for enrichment activities and um, to actually uh, begin those activities and it's the same thing we're trying to do a recurring model where every uh, couple of weeks we're looking at that so that they don't actually get into that um, component where they're failing as well. And so that happens on the elementary and the middle school level. So do we have data on students who get to the end of the year and don't complete things the way they're supposed to? We have we data on those. And those, the next well, those year? are the students who we invite um, to come. And so we start to invite them around April to come to our summer enrichment programs um, to try to make up for those deficit standards. And what Performance Matters does now is now we have down to the standard on what they did not um, master that we can go over and infuse in those programs. So like Sylvan or somebody would do? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's a chart on, it's um, 14, and I see that the columns on those charts are the grades, but if you look at the MCAP, um, pre-pandemic MCAP, 
In ELA, it would be 14.3% for ELA math, 5% and science for 14.4%. Can you explain the uh, disparity between the student, the percentage of students found proficient on the MCAP and the percentage of students um, getting a grade C or better? So the data from the MCAP is almost three years ago, so these are not the same students. So that's, that's one part um, that's there. And what this data is telling us and our performance matter data is telling us is that we're on the right track to definitely meet those goals for improvement for our MCAP. So one of the things that we're trying to do is look at leading data, not our lagging data. So this is real-time data that we're able to do, and we di differentiate. This is one component for our grades. Our performance matter is another component. Um, doing informal observations with our teachers is another part. Our data dialogues with our instructional leadership team is another component. And so this data here um, that we're using is telling us that we're on the right track to make sure that we uh, demonstrate that growth in the MCAP. Everything from the MCAP is almost two to three years ago, and those students um, are not no longer in the building. Okay, so you think that two or three years ago, the grades would have matched the proficiency scores? So that's a good question, Ms. Rowe. Because that would have I, meant most of the kids I, are I, failing. I, yeah, well. Right? I mean, if, if well, our here's, grades. Here's, here's the reality. Okay. The grades represent a body of work that the, the professional, the teachers, provide in the marking period. The MCAP is an assessment close to the end of the year that's given. And so pre-pandemic, that question was raised by yours truly. Can we do a crosswalk of grades and the performance of MCAP? And, and it was all over the place. So in other words, what you're saying is if a student earns an A or B or C, can we correlate that to some kind of performance on the state assessment? And so we are still unpacking that. It is hard to do that for what I just said. The grades Wait. represent a body of work, so a let body me see. of opportunities. I want to make sure the full board understand. When you look at a grade book of what kids get for a marking period, it's a body of work versus one assessment. But you raise a, an interesting question that I think most school systems have been grappling with, can we do this correlation of, and I think um, Ms. Mack may have asked that my first year, can we do that cor correlation? Um, the answer is for us, not yet. And, it, and this fall assessment is a, pre is a precursor to the spring assessment until we know what that looks like. I think that's, that's some more work that Mr. Connolly would love to so dive in. So, okay, so so I think you, you you're asking a good question at this time. When we did a preliminary, it wasn't a one to one correlation. Um, so our grades do not accurately predict how a child is going to do on the MCAP. So, for instance, if a child, um, you know, one kid could be getting straight A's and not get proficient on the MCAP. Is there the kid that's getting like D's and E's that is proficient on the MCAP? Does that happen? We have some outliers. We have some that we can see if they're doing well, excuse me. But at this point, the research folks would not allow me to make a, a, a definitive answer saying grades associate with this performance on the on the state so assessment there's no correlation between grades Hi, there's no correlation between grades and assessment that's a good research project miss Rowe, and i think if we can unpack that that will be helping all of our systems okay. so thank you i can't answer that at this time thank you miss mack yes um thank you um is it doctor or Ms. Joseph? Uh, Ms. Joseph. I wanted to make sure. Ms. Joseph, I appreciate your comment about leading versus lagging. And I think I'm piggybacking on what Ms. Rose said, but how do the grades shown in this presentation on pages 8, 9, and 10 compare to the proficiency levels on the MSDE early fall assessments that 
we just talked about in the last board meeting in ELA, math, and MISA. So for the um, for our grades there, are you saying are they comparable to? Well, you made a comment that you can't use old data, but we do have new data, even though it's an abbreviated and different test. So for the early fall assessment, we really are waiting to we see the spring assessment because it has to demonstrate the growth. That was one snapshot in time. This is another snapshot in time, and then our spring um, assessments will really tell us the full measure of growth. So I can, um, if I'm invited, I'll come back um, a after that to really begin to show that part there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, would, and I, let oh. me just make a comment. I would go back and look at the presentation because I remember Mr. Conley referenced the scoring of the fall assessment and how that differs and it's a wider span. And I appreciate that question, Ms. Mack. Um, that's why we talk about multiple data points so not only are we going to look at grades, we look at these external assessments to see how our individual students are doing. And to, to just reiterate, our performance matters, our platform provides that by standard. So it feels like board members want to associate grades with the state assessment. Um, I would always offer that we, we have to look at multiple data points because what a student may have done in the fall is different than what they may have done at the end of a second marking period and then again back in spring. So we, we look at the totality. We presented the MAP M and MAP R results as well to see growth. So that's why I, I keep going back. I appreciate the questions. Um, we, well, again, we still have to look at the multiple data points just to see what are, what's happening with our individual students. So anyway, I just want to say that. Thank you. Um, my next question, I don't know who it's for. Um, I want to draw your attention to slide 11. During the February 22nd board meeting, the board was informed that referral to a pupil personnel worker, worker does not happen until a student has missed 36 days of school, which I believe equates to a full quarter of school. So my question is, is there any evidence um, that shows that earlier and consistent involvement of a PPW improves outcomes and how can we allow a student to miss a full quarter of school? So for the, I can speak to that. For the PPWs, um, we absolutely do referrals before that time. Um, our PPWs are a part of um, our, our different teams where, where if we first see that there's an issue um, with students, um, they're part of all of our safety meetings. Um, I just was emailing a PPW today on an emergency that we were made aware of. And so they're an integral um, team member and they are not just there just for the attendance. Um, if we're starting to have extreme issues and we don't get in touch with a parent, um, they're, they're able to help connect us to the home. Um, a lot of times we have students who are in foster care. Um, they, they begin to be, be a liaison um, as well for that. So we do our referrals um, way before that time period in, in most of the schools, in all of our schools. And how about, how, how can we allow students to miss a full quarter of school? So there are, we do a tier one, tier two, and tier three. So like if you first get to um, three days, we definitely have the notices that come out through Schoology and those messages. Schools are calling, um, they're mailing letters home. And again, if we don't hear from our parents, um, that's where we actually, the PPWs do home visits. Sometimes numbers are disconnected or parents aren't connected through Schoology. We're able to do that. We invite the parents up. Um, for attendance meetings, uh, we do them virtually, but now we're in person, we can do them in person. So there are a number of strategies that we put in place with the last thing, even taking uh, parents to court. That's our last result, um, but we have had to do that. So I would just like to end with, I was a court appointed special advocate for kids in foster care for eight years, and I am currently a licensed foster parent. Mm -hmm. and. That is the population of students more than any other population of students who need to be well educated because when they age out of the system, many of them have nobody to fall back on. So I would encourage you, for obviously all of our students, but for that population, they will only have themselves and the education with which they're provided to go forward in life. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Excuse me, yes, thank you. Um, 
my question was, well, one, first of all, I'd like to thank um, uh, Mr. Martin and Ms. Kyria Joseph, Ms. Kyria Joseph for coming here today for a wonderful um, presentation and sharing um, with everyone uh, what the school, what the schools are doing and in particular what Newtown is doing. And I wanted to find out from Mr. Martin, what are some of the um, successes or some of the, um, I guess, sort of achievements that you can speak to um, that have come out of Newtown? this year? Um, I can speak on um, a couple of things, but I'm going to highlight our seniors right now. Um, we are a national avid demonstration school, and as of right now, we're pushing um, $6 million in scholarship money from our avid national um, demonstration um, school right now, just from that class. Um, we have a plethora of seniors who have been accepted into four-year colleges. Um, so we're celebrating that. I encourage everyone to definitely check out our social media um, at on Twitter um, at Newtown High School just to see the many different colleges from um, Clark. I have a student um, that, the a first student of mine that was accepted into Morehouse. Um, we have uh, Howard University, we have Morgan University, but um, all over the country um, being accepted. Um, so those are just a few. Um, what I do want to say also is we have about, uh, I want to say about a third of our students that we just celebrated uh, last week um, making the honor roll, which was a, a big success. So we have many things to be proud of. Um, and then we're waiting um, for our IB program. Our students um, are going through assessments, and I, I definitely commend our first group of IB students um, as they go through internal and external assessments in the next couple of months um, to receive their CP or DP diploma. So we're excited about that news coming as well. Thank you for that under your um, leadership. Um, it, that, that sounds wonderful. So thank you very much for coming and thank you for sharing your thank successes. You. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Oh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. And it's so great to see you, Mr. Martin and Ms. Joseph again. I feel like I was just at Newtown High School a few weeks ago. Um, so one of my questions is about the suspension rates. Uh, I'm trouble, I'm, I don't understand what the percentages mean. Is that? the amount of altercations that result in a suspension or the amount of students that have been suspended in, in general? So that is the amount of the students that have been suspended. Okay, thank you. That, that is, it's very different when I look at it in that way. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think during the presentation, it was mentioned that someone mentioned restorative practices uh, and kind of result to the suspensions and, and, and ask students coming back. So can you expand on the restorative practices and maybe Mr. Martin, if you employ them in your school, could you talk about how it's done at Newtown? Yes, so um, if we have a suspension, um, we have a reinstatement date. Um, during that time, um, we, we definitely do restorative practices, but um, before we would suspend a student, um, we try to do restorative practices as well. So this would include whatever the incident involved, um, the administrator, the counselor, um, and the teacher, um, just to try to see what resources we can offer so the offenses don't happen again. Um, through restorative uh, practices, we also find out more about the student, what they need. We always review grades um, just to support the student overall in attendance. Um, and of course, the parent is included in that, and we always try to encourage the parent to make sure they're updated with their student's successes uh, through the different outlets um, like Schoology um, or Focus, um, just so they can be updated. And then we also have some outside partners where we have had to use community conferencing, um, where there are two different peers, especially sometimes when families are involved. Um, and that has been a powerful partnership for schools as well. That's incredible. Um, I was also just at Windsor Mill Middle School. Mm -hmm. And I, we were walking in the classroom, and one of the classrooms are a little more hectic. And they went into a circle when I walked into the classroom. They were sort of practice a circle. And it was like such an incredible experience to be able to hear that open dialogue and open communication between students. So I want to learn more about restorative practices and how they're being implemented in BCPS, because I think they really are the way forward. Um, thank you if so I, much. If I may just add sure. to that, you'll also see that in our alternative schools as, as well. But I just want to 
reiterate a statement that Mr. Connolly wrote. Logical, I uh, said, logical consequences are followed when student behavior warrants disciplinary action. There's this belief that restorative practice replaces action, especially if it's a consequence that must have disciplinary action. And I'm gonna call on Principal Martin or Ms. Joseph to please reiterate what we have said as we return to in-person learning about student behaviors. You can paraphrase oh, if you sure. so choose. There, there are times where we have to uh, do a short-term suspension and at times a long-term suspension. Um, you'll notice that in the data, um, that as you see, it, it has increased um, because of some of the behaviors that we have seen. Um, and our alternative schools work with those students um, on their decision making um, there, and we um, have multiple um, areas that we're working on. So there was, um, I guess, a myth that schools were not suspending. That is not true. Um, we have been, and the behaviors have warranted it. Um, but when we suspend, we definitely are still working with the student, and we have learned that we have to um, employ supports to families as well. Um, so we are continuing to do that. Um, so we, there are times, again, where we do have to do a local uh, suspension, and there is a long-term suspension where a board hearing is in place. Um, and so we are following that um, as, the, as the behaviors warrant. Um, we are looking you know, for solutions, as all districts are, um, but we are suspending. Um, a lot of times people don't want that, I guess, to be said, but I'm, I'm just going to say it. It has to happen um, for some of the behaviors that, that we are seeing and experiencing um, from um, our students. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Joe. And that, Ms. Jones? Oh, oh, I did have one more question. Go ahead. I, thank you. I'm wondering, um, from, from your experience, Ms. Joseph, looking at as an executive director or Mr. Martin in your own school community, are you seeing a trend in, in student suspensions? Are, are students that are suspended once suspended again, or is it, or maybe even in your professional experience, or is it more of a one-time suspension? It used to be um, it was the same students, but now we're getting a sporadic behavior, watching social media and then trying to do those images there. It's, it's, it is sporadic. Um, it's from students that you wouldn't typically see from all schools um, that I've, I've been serving. So this year, it is, it's, it is sporadic where you can't necessarily see the trick or, or see it, um, it, is, it is very sporadic, but um, some of it is the social media, um, some of it is the attention. We have seen and we have done a great job with increasing our activities in school because the thought was maybe they weren't doing enough. So not just athletics, but all activities. Um, schools have really done a great job and thank you to the teachers who serve as EDA sponsors um, for doing those activities. Multiple schools have Saturday programs. Again, it's about enrichment. I encourage any business partners that are listening, please <laughs> hire our students um, so that they, um, they have something to do. So it's about engagement, um, and we're really trying to use a multi-tier approach for that. So, But right now, it is spontaneous, and we're trying to make sure that we're engaging our students um, in the best way that we can for their interest, whatever that interest is, uh, so that it's, that energy is put forth in a positive way. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. Ms. Jones? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. I had a very specific question. Do you have your suspension rate for Newtown High School ballpark figure? Since it's, it's system-wide, did you have something specifically for your school? So as of right now, the only data we have is system-wide while it, while it is um, currently being updated specifically for um, individual schools. And so, Ms. Uh, Jost, for his, for his suspension rate, it's, it's pretty comparable to my other high schools, most of my high schools. Um, and, and this data from when it was pulled, just to be transparent, we had some suspensions this week. Um, but the data is, uh, is around the same percentage. So it's not above. It's, a, it's so, showing, showing around the same percentage where um, our ninth grade data here is about 4%. Um, it's hovering around a 3%. So there's not an outlier for the Newtown High School. It's about the same average for my high school's most of my high schools had an increase from first marking period to second period, second marking period in suspension data. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. Thank you. And thank you all very much for the presentation. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Mrs. Causey? 
Go ahead. Thank you. And Thank you. Ryan, did you? Um, so um, th there's been conversation over years around the grading policy implementation, and there's been a review that's been ongoing, I understand, for over a year, and it's set to the, for the board to have an update, but at the very end of the year, which I think is too late. Um, but I wanted to understand, is there an analysis of, and we, the board just uh, requested this information, which schools are using the zero to 100 scale, which schools are using the 50 to 100 scale? Um, and is the grading focus group currently meeting, uh, the one that includes TABCO case, other key staff and stakeholders, um, and have there been any surveys done to the instructional team leaders, parents, uh, teachers, as to any improvements that, uh, that they might recommend to what the current grading implementation is, which is the procedures. So I can address that. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, our grading and reporting uh, work group is, does meet. They meet once a month uh, to continue that work. Uh, we have surveyed the schools to identify which schools have um, chosen which scales to use. Uh, and we are working through that process, and we're on track to come to the board as scheduled. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And has there been analysis of uh, for um, implementing semester schedules as the board uh, approved in 2019 within the ADB day schedule? Uh, because at uh, Hereford High School, Catonsville High School, and there were two other high schools using that, a student could take math, English, science, whatever, the first semester. If they did not uh, master it, maybe they didn't fail, maybe they got a C, but they still really didn't master the content. They could repeat that within the same year with a group of students, uh, you know, in a similar circumstance. Um, and so that would really help our students' situation. Uh, we understand that 18 out of 24 schools use semester schedules during the 2020, excuse me, which year are we in now, right? 2020, 2021 year. Um, because there's definite benefits to that. So um, all of our um, principals were allowed the opportunity to review our process for analyzing their schedules. Um, and there are uh, principals who are moving forward with that process, um, getting input from their community, um, students, and their parents as they're, as they're looking at the best uh, model for their uh, schools. So the, the actual motion, it, supported the recommendation of BCPS um, school day task force recommendations, which was led by the chief of organizational effectiveness at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about which courses could be included in semester schedules because it doesn't change the master schedule or the bell schedule. Okay, that's time, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Thank you. If, if, if I, I may had, just I had other respond, questions, but I'll email them. Uh, Madam and Chair, I appreciate it. Briefly, because uh, I know there's several yes, questions. Yes, please, Dr. Um, Williams. The 19, 2019, I won't do what... 2019 and 2020, that was an option we put forth because of the pandemic and because of what we were hearing from our principals and the requests they had to look at their schedule. And then to circle back to the grading and reporting, thank you, Bos um, Dr. Boswell McComas. You know, the work is a year long work. And at some point, as we're getting closer to the end of the year, we're going to look at all that feedback. We're going to see if we're going to, if there are some changes that we would then communicate and would have the summer to communicate to start of the fall. So, Ms. Causey, that grading and reporting report, um, you, I appreciate it, you bring it up every time, um, that we, we're going to present. Um, just that feedback, and if there's any change, that will give us the summer to communicate with schools and families and students. So when the new school year starts, if there's some changes, we're able to implement. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Uh, thank everyone. And, and I have some specific questions for Mr. Martin, only because you're a guy in a classroom in the building. Uh, I'm just a couple of them easy, and then, uh, then I want your opinion. Um, how, now let me think how I phrase it. How many kids in your building? Um, uh, about 1,350, 1,350. Okay. How many's in the IB program? So when we say how many are in the IB program, we are a school of international studies. Every student that comes in the building um, is, a, is an IB student. Um, they come in ninth and 10th grade as our mid-years program, and then we want them to choose a path, whether it's the career path or diploma path when they get to 
11th and 12th grade. Okay. Now, these next two questions, and, and please don't give me the answer you think I want to hear. I, I believe that, that young people need consequences for bad behavior. If there's no consequences, the behaviors will continue. How do you feel about that? So I, I, I believe that um, consequences are needed for um, certain behaviors or disciplinary action for certain behaviors in school as well. And, and I think that smart, tough kids will tell you what you want to hear. What do you say about that? Um, all kids will tell you what you want to hear <laughs> if you have the right to shut down. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. <laughs> Well, just to add to that, keep in mind of what I appreciate hearing from the school's perspective and those who support schools. It's the totality. So there's the student, there's the school, there's the parent and guardian. And that's why we went forth with our town hall meetings to educate or just to inform our community. So when we talk about behavior and we talk about consequence and we could, we could argue about what does a consequence mean. You know, the consequence in the Williams family may be just a look, and that will get the message. So, 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 but I just want to emphasize why we did our town hall meetings, because the school cannot do it alone. We have students for seven, six and a half, six forty-five minutes, seven hours a day, but there's the totality which things happen before and after school, even during the school. So we do have that partnership with our parents and guardian to try to, to pr respond to our students in the most appropriate way. And so that's why we did our town hall meetings. We reached out to the PTSA. We're about to do this multi-district co communication because this is what's happening in our society. And I think in many cases, um, students want attention. So I appreciate you giving the answer. Either way, Mr. Martin, you're going to give your honest answer, or not just a politically correct. But I think many of our kids, uh, in, in some t cases, just need that relationship. You and I talked about that, the relationship, that they know somebody in their cares and somebody is watching and will respond. And so I just want to thank you for asking those questions. Thank you. Any board members who have not had a chance to ask questions? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, so one of the trends when looking at the suspension rates as well is that ninth grade, this is significantly higher than 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And I'm wondering, is that a typical trend for a high school prior to the pandemic too? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The transition year. Yes. It, yes, it is a typical trend. Okay. Yeah. And what do you think it is about that transition year that makes it so high? I was just curious. Uh, I think um, some of it is just emotionally, like they're just dealing with um, some some different things. There are more peers, there are more people um, that's there, um, and they're trying to really find their way. Remember, we talked about connection and, and where do they belong, and so sometimes they uh, follow a way that is not the path that they should until they can, um, and so we really work hard with our transition programs. Remember when we used to have, we still have the sixth grade, and we do things with them in the summer, and we do the same thing with ninth grade, right. so remember that, so we're continuing those things, and we're hopeful that this summer we can get back to in-person. Um, we did do those things virtually, but it's going to be that in-person um, um, direct connection with the students to really get them connected. And it's back to those clubs, engagement, what is their interest, and we connect it to them quickly. That's awesome. If I may add to uh, Ms. Joseph's comments, thank you so much. Um, our system improvement team, and I know you've heard a lot about the different uh, work groups and the work that's being done, they're actually expanding that um, transition uh, activities and, and opportunities and orientation to being a year-long process for kindergarten, third grade, sixth grade, and ninth grade. So that's what they're um, working on currently. Thank you so much. And I, I remember visiting Newton High School and hearing about all the different clubs and activities there. So when it was mentioned, I just re remembered that. My last question is about the IB program, and it is how do you think having IB at Newton High School has changed the, the community? How, what do you think it has done to better the community at Newtown, or, or what, are your, what are the effects of, of the IB program so far? Um, one, one of the things I had to see is um, how our school can benefit from the IB program, and I, I think when you think about uh, focusing on the whole child, um, that, that has really built 
um, our community and built our students. So um, it is about academics, um, but it's about characters as well. And it's about opening it up um, outside of your community to better, better the whole world. So when our students leave, I know um, that they will have a pro uh, we will have a better productive citizen in the community. Okay, thank you so much. Anything else, Mr. Thomas? No, that's everything Are this time. Sure? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. You Thank too. you all. The next item on the agenda are information items, including the financial report for January 2022, Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting minutes of January 24th, and update on key school legislation. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. First is committee updates, and we'll start with the audit committee. Mr. McMillian. Our last meeting was Tuesday, March 15th. We have a meeting coming up on Tuesday, April 19th at 4.30, and I'm happy to say that our meetings are real quick. So if anybody, if, if you want to listen in our meetings, you won't spend a lot of time, hopefully. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Budget Committee, Mr. Kuhn is not here. Um, I'll speak for that. We, we had a great meeting. I'd like to thank staff um, for providing a lot of helpful information for that. Um, hopefully he can provide the update at our next meeting, um, but I would encourage all board members to listen to the recording of that and check out the information that was shared. It's very, very helpful. So thank you to all the staff that, that support us on the budget committee. Um, buildings and contracts, Ms. Joes. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, the next building and contracts committee is on April 5th at 3.30, the day of the board meeting. Um, that's a slight change from uh, when we usually have our meetings. Uh, I would encourage all board members to look at the contracts. We have uh, a large number of contracts that are going to be there. If you could review those prior to the building and contracts, that would be appreciated. Uh, Ms. Hen, are we also discussing agenda item? Um, I'm going to go around and, yes, we'll come back for agenda items. All right, thank Th you. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, curriculum committee, Ms. Mack? Yes, thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, the curriculum committee meeting, curriculum committee met on March 17th. Ms. Shea, Dr. McComas, and Mr. Billingsley provided information on our social studies electives. Uh, I learned that BCPS currently offers 40 social study elective courses. We did have some informal discussion about perhaps utilizing some of the lessons we've learned from VLP to ha to increase the number of social study classes that are offered using virtual technology. Um, the courses that we discussed can be found in the PowerPoint attached to the curriculum committee um, meeting in board docs. Our next meeting is April 21st at 2 p.m. Thank you. Equity committee, Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Yeah. Yes, sorry, I was on mute. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the board had its equity committee meeting March 17, 2022. Um, we discussed the virtual learning program. Um, it was an update on where we are, how it's going, student family. It was based on the student family survey results. And um, it was presented by Dr. Doug Elmendorf uh, and uh, Ms. Julie Forbes. And um, in the survey, students shared reasons why families chose virtual the virtual learning program and it was just aggregated um by the student group and also um by parents so that's a very um good survey it was very informative and it asked um the reasons why uh students chose to enroll in the vlp program it was from the perspective of the parents and from the perspective of the students and our next meeting will be to that date here our next uh, meeting will, the next equity committee meeting will be the Equity Advisory Council, and it will be held on Thursday, March 24th at 5.30 p.m., and the next equity committee meeting will be held Thursday, April 21st, 2022 at 4 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Legislative and Government Relations uh, Committee has met on March 3rd. Uh, the um, minutes are available on board docs uh, with, under the committee meeting. Um, there's a lot that's going on that was discussed. Uh, also, the MABE uh, Legislative Committee took place on March 14th. Um, 
those um, reports have been sent to the full board. And uh, our next meeting is tomorrow, March 23rd, um, and that agenda is available. Um, also, as Ms. Hen pointed out, as a point of information, there is a 40-page document um, with an update on the legislation related to education that's taking place um, thus far this session. Okay. So then, Mr. Thomas, is there anything that you wanted to add as the vice chair? Sure, thank you for the opportunity, Ms. Causey. Just that I think the Legislative Committee is doing some great work, and I really appreciate working with Ms. Causey to lead the committee. I can't wait for our additional meeting tomorrow. Thank you both. Um, last but not least, the Policy Review Committee, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. The Policy Review Committee met on March 14th, 2022. We were able to move several policies forward. However, there remains a significant amount of work to do as we have a number of items that have moved from one PRC agenda to another over the last two meetings. This is the result of having to give um, priority to policies which we have legal deadlines to complete and the robust discussion the members of the PRC wish to have on each policy. We have added additional meetings to account for the needed time and are beginning meetings a bit earlier. I'm open to having even more meetings, however, we are limited by the availability of committee members and staff. The committee will continue to work with staff to move as much work as we can. At this time, I'm requesting the board members refrain from requesting new policy review projects be added to the agenda until such a time as the committee can get caught up with the policy work created by the OIGE report, changes to state laws, and the mandatory rotation that policies be reviewed on a specific time cycle. The next policy review committee meeting is March 30th, 2022 from 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Next is board member comments and agenda items for future board meetings, and we'll start with Ms. Rao. I just want to say um, it was nice to hear a lot about the IB programs in our school system. My daughter's in an IB program, and she absolutely loves it. And I'm really glad that we're expanding IB programs to other parts of the county, and I hope that we will really continue to do that. Um, and I do not have any additional agenda items, thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for agenda items, I um, would, uh, I think it would be helpful, we heard some really um, uh, interesting and, and um, positive information about the Performance Matters Program, helping to identify uh, needed supports, and I think it would be helpful for the full board and the public to uh, receive um, an update on that. I don't know if that can be in an email or in a board meeting or um, even if there's these amazing results possible in a, in, in a press release. <laughs> so um, I think that would be important. Um, and in terms of the grading policy implementation um, review that's happening, if it can be brought forward sooner, I think that would be important in order to evaluate any and every um, improvement that we might make for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack? I had an agenda item and comments, but I left it home, so I'll pass. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Jose? Thank you. Uh, so in December of 2021, the Office of Inspector General of Education had stated that the Board of Education had violated procurement laws. In response, the Board of Education on January 25th uh, responded with a letter and a corrective action plan. I would like for the board on the agenda item to have a uh, progress on how we are doing with those eight corrective action plans, policies, and other uh, items that we promised we would be addressing, uh, time of schedule and timeline, if that could be on the agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. McMillian? Uh, I'd just like the board to know and the public that we haven't forgotten about moving the board meetings around the county. The central staff's looking at the logistics involved, and hopefully we'll bring it back to the board and we'll discuss it and decide what we want to do, whether we want to pursue that or not. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, Ms. Hunt. Uh, first, I want to congratulate our 42nd student member of the board-elect for BCPS, Ms. Roa Hassan. Uh, many of you may already know her from her 
public comment that she's given at board meetings. Um, but both her and the other candidate, Masafar, did an incredible job campaigning with students across the county to increase student turnout for this election. And I'm excited to continue to work with Baltimore County Student Councils these next few months to continue to increase turnout. Ro will be an amazing SMOB next year, and she is both ambitious, excited, and ready to get to work. She's, she's so incredible. Um, since the start of March, I have visited 21 schools in BCPS, and I'll list them really quickly. Kemet High School, Newton High School, Hereford High School, Delaney High School, San Bernardino Middle School, Windsor Mill Middle School, Sudbrook Magnet Middle School, Hereford Middle School, Pine Grove, Lock Raven Technical, Cockeysville, Ridgely, Middlesex Elementary School, Edmonds and Heights, Johnny Cake, Logan, 7th District, Chadwick, Campfield Early Learning Center, and Fedonia International. And they were all such incredible visits, uh, witnessing everything from restorative practices and conscious discipline in play, academic excellence and incredible magnet programs, petting baby chicks with the students at Hereford High School, touring the outside of the new Northeast Elementary School, Rossville Elementary School with staff to learn more about it, and just walking in the hallways, going in the cafeterias, and, and really connecting with our students to understand the diverse needs of our system. Lastly, I just wanna state that the curriculum committee is doing some great work. I really loved our presentation last Thursday about the social studies electives, and I encourage all of our board members to go back and review that presentation. Thank you, and have a great night, everyone. Mr. Offerman? Yes, uh, I would like further uh, a further look at, at the two various types of, uh, of, uh, of, of high school scheduling options. Uh, my, my, I have heard, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Causey talk about the benefits, and I, I agree with a lot of what she said. My concern is what happens in, in sort of sequential things. If you take the course in the first semester, so let's say Algebra two or Algebra one, like for instance, and in the second semester, you're now headed to Algebra two, but if, you know, but it, it, it could be a, a, an eight month, an, uh, an eight month gap. And I, I'm, I'm concerned about that and that and, and, and foreign languages and, and maybe, uh, and maybe uh, se several other courses in terms of, of how that might, uh, how that might, uh, uh, how that might, excuse me, how that might, uh, impact success for students. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, I would just like to see, as I've said before, an update on um, where we are with the board recommendations from the efficiency review by Public Works. Um, I think it does us a disservice to act like there were no recommendations specific to the board and to not discuss them. Um, they were serious and they uh, speak directly to the role of this board and to the success of the school system. So I would like to see that addressed on um, an agenda item coming up specifically. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I just uh, want to think back to the beginning of the meeting when we honored our state counselors of the year and I would be great in a future agenda item to uh, dig deeper into how we can support our counselors across the county. Um, we heard about a, the best, I, the ideal ratios and the ideal use of their time during the school day and uh, how close we are to meeting that and things like that. I think it would be great to cover. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kuhn is not here. I will um, second, uh, as far as an agenda item, I would love to see a demo of Performance Matters and to learn more about that system, including how it fits in with our um, educators' days. Um, we continue to add more to the school day, so I'd like to see what we're taking off their plates in order for them to use this, what it's replacing, and how they fit it in with their days and how we can support them in using it. Um, also, I look forward to learning about the multi-district safety roundtable that Dr. Williams shared with us in April and any outcomes of that as well as learning about the comprehensive school safety plan. Um, I'm excited to hear more particularly about the school safety assistance and other initiatives um, to improve school climate because that's we've continued to hear um, across the system about how important that is and addressing the um, social emotional needs of our, our students but also in the, addressing the behaviors that have resulted as a result. So look forward to that. So thank you everyone for sharing those. And that brings us to the last item on the agenda, which is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, April 5th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting's now adjourned.